your headspace is your biggest enemy and it's just like just do it and see what happens yeah like big believer of you're either going to win or you'll lose. Hello and welcome everybody to the Kyle Reaver podcast. Yeah, my name's Kyle Reaver, in case you didn't know. This is a podcast where on the odd occasion, more than often, we speak to people who have done some pretty interesting things with their life and are doing pretty interesting things further on who we would walk past in the street and just think they're quite ordinary. Um, This guy beside me, he is very ordinary. Um, (laughs) Extraordinary. (laughs) He's like a warm beer. It's an acquired taste, <laughs> but no, nah, I love him to bits. Um, he's helped my family a lot and we've known him for a long time. And you'll probably see he's got a little bit of a story about him too. Um, we did have a little chat as we always do. Is there anything we can't talk about off air? And he's the first one that's gone, well, there is a list, but um, we'll try and squeeze a little bit out of him as we go. But Bradley Sissons, welcome. Thank you, Carl Reva. For the record, on recording date for this podcast, it is Bradley Sisson's birthday. This, this is this is the connection we have. He's coming over here on his birthday and doing this podcast. How old are you, Bradley? Thirty nine. Jesus Christ! Yes, all right. Getting old. I was thirty nine once. It was <laughs> nineteen sixty two. Shut up, Bradley. <laughs> this this is this one's going to be fun. This one's going to be fun. All right, so as if you've listened to these podcasts before, there's a list of questions that Brad has been sent. Um, You can't see it, but Brad has notes. Um, Very good. Always need to have notes. (laughs) (laughs) Which means he's taken time and he's um, actually put some thought into this. So list of 10 questions. Um, Some of them take longer than others. We do duck off on tangents. But question number one. Birth to now in seven minutes, but it's never seven minutes. Three, two, one, go. Well, 39 years ago today, Uh I was born. (laughs) Um, Well, I was born in about four hours' time. (laughs) Had a very traditional upbringing. So mum, dad, I'm one of four. and Brisbane born and bred? Brisbane born and bred or Gold Coast technically, Gold Coast Hospital, but don't hold that against me. No, never. Dad worked hard. Mum was a stay-at-home mum because she had four kids, so pretty much full-time work, probably a harder job than Dad had. Um, went to school at a little Seventh-day Adventist college, so we're talking through. Cute. Very cute. <laughs> when you're one of 300 kids and you're not the good kid. Um, you stand out. <laughs> yes, every teacher knew my name. Now, um, we, we talk about you being... Well, for want of a better word, by the way, you can swear as much as you want. <laughs> for want of a better word, in your younger years, you were a little turd. Yes. Did that spread over to your siblings? Challenging. Not as much. What, made, they, what made you more of a turd? I, I would say I've got more of my father in me than my mother. Okay. So a little bit more aggression. Mm-hmm. A little bit more of a backbone, Mm -hmm. a lot more confrontational, Mm -hmm. and a lack of a respect for authority when I was younger. (laughs) The list kept going on. Yeah, small list, but yes, uh, that was probably the big thing is more like my dad than I am my mum. I've still got a bit of mum in me. All right. Another good bit to keep me grounded, but yes. So move back to school. What did what parent what did your father do? Father was a real estate agent, okay. so ex-military, and then got into real estate and got very good. But interesting change. Yes, pretty much the same job these days. Um, <laughs> <laughs> dealing with idiots all day. No, the family business. So he literally worked six and a half, seven days a week. Yeah, every day. And mum did the school run and drop off and pick up and dealt with us children while dad was out earning the money to pay the bills so so real estate is a lot of hours for the record bradley Mm. works in real estate too um you didn't see as much of your father uh, obviously as your mother was it growing up no 
No. He was just working. He was always working. But in the, what is this, the late 80s, early 90s? Yeah, 80s to 90s. That's what she did, wasn't yep. it? And you got up early, went to work for 12 hours, came home, ate, went to bed, and then repeat. Got up and did it yeah. again. Deep down. What happened then? No, oh, that was about it. No. High school? <laughs> High school, I probably got worse, that wonderful world of puberty and testosterone and challenging authority. So mm -hmm. I was... High school on the Gold Coast, Brisbane? No, Brisbane. So same, same Sevy school. I did prep all the way to grade 12 in the same okay. school. Um, What's that like? Interesting at the time because I didn't know any better. But, but the same people you went into prep with, you went into high school, high school with? Yeah, there were a couple of friends there that we literally were in the same class every year for 12 years you see a which lot of is very uncommon now well yeah because you see a lot of schools doing the whole prep through to grade 12 thing now i think that would be a very different experience to how you would be like switching schools and that sort of thing oh now for sure yeah no seeing what my girls get exposed to and experience like they go to a school that has the same number of kids in their grade as I had in my school. Yeah. So very different world. Would that, um, was there again, cause like not the naughty kids in prep stayed the naughty kids right the way All the through. way through pretty much. So yeah. you had to pick your tribe and kind of stick Early with on. your tribe. Yeah. By grade one, mm. you knew where you stood. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, high school, were you a scholar? No, I, I am. Was that a choice? No, I I did try for uh -huh. the end half of grade 12. <laughs> bit, Tried really hard, but it, it was a bit late. <laughs> Even got bribes on if I got an A on a report card, I would be financially incentivized. Um, did it work? I tried. I got C's instead of D's. So, so yeah. D's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, but I, I'm not a learn from a book type of person. Okay. Um, and I think when I found out my youngest daughter had dyslexia two years ago, mm -hmm. it was a real eye opener because the lady doing the testing was explaining what was going on. And I went, huh, That's me. that makes sense now. Um, apparently it's not normal the way, way we see things. Um, I think that's funny because the people, like I know so many adults now um, and their children are having things like, dyslexia learning difficulties adhd autism and the symptoms are being read out and they're going fuck that's me yeah yeah <laughs> in the 90s that stuff didn't exist you, you were did. just a you painful just, child you're a pain yeah. in the ass yeah. yeah didn't listen weren't picking it up so yeah and you were just pushed to the side yeah okay so high school you finished high school yes finished it which was a surprise <laughs> so i thought I'm not the only one was, that was surprised. Was no one more yeah, surprised no. than you? Uh, I, I reckon I was the second most surprised person. <laughs> Who was the most surprised? I would say my mother. So growing up, like I said, you spent a lot more time with your mother than your father. Um, was there different parenting styles? Very, very different parenting styles. And that styles. caused conflict between your parents and you? A little bit. Only because mum was a primary caregiver and dad was a disciplinary one and I not afraid of pain and yeah. that probably frustrated my father. So while my other siblings were quite easily yep. behave or I'll tell your father when he gets home, I was phone. like, well, call him. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then when mum called, cut the telephone cord, like, you know, back when <laughs> sorry, phones were sorry. connected. Yeah. You actually cut the telephone? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, that's great. You know, <laughs> snitches get stitches. It was <laughs> couldn't, couldn't double me if the phone call was cut. <laughs> was there okay? All right, so let's. I'm only, I don't want to use the word criminal, but were you a smart little turd or were you like good at trying to cover the tracks or? Unfortunately, very good at it, <laughs> which, yeah, very, very good at hiding things. From pretty much everyone. I was, think it's the built-in skill set that no one talks about. Uh, was it um was it a game? Like, did you ever stop and like because we know that, you know, and I'm again, yeah. we're not gonna go too much in this. We know you were a little turd when yeah. you were younger. 
it was fun pushing the boundaries to see how far we could push. Was them. there ever moments, or can you remember a moment where you stopped and went, okay, I've gone too far here? Yes. Yes, there was one where I couldn't hide the evidence when I was in high school because I was involved in a bit of a, a fisty cuffs. Mm -hmm. And normally when you can hide stuff and put a shirt on and yep. walk around, you yep. couldn't hide your, your, the damage I, I lost. Your I, makeup applying skills I, weren't up to scratch. Not near the level <laughs> required <laughs> to the point when I got home, mum called dad to take me to the hospital and said, you need to just sit down and stay there. Yep. Yeah. With your siblings, because you were the rat bag, did they try to blame you for shit? They didn't have to. You no, just that was, that was, that's that, me. That, that one's that me. Was, that was the worst <laughs> bit, especially with my older brother, who we get along really well now, because he's got six years on me. It was a little bit challenging when we were getting into teenagers. Where are you? Are you the youngest? I'm the second oldest. So, second oldest. Yeah. Isn't it funny, like, you have those siblings, um, that like growing up, you literally hardly will speak to each other. Yeah. But as you For get older, 15 years you're, then, you're inseparable. Yeah. yeah. Yes. To the point we'll drop up to town for just to hang out with him. Mm. So, mm. yeah, but we didn't get along, but I get it now. I was a bit full on. Yeah. You were, you were, yeah. yeah. I still am to a degree. So, but I think it's also you discover, like you appreciate and you go, yeah, you know what? I yeah. Was, I was a little shit. Own it. Yeah. <laughs> So you finished high school? Finished high school where I got a part-time job at the wonderful Mickey D's at Springwood oh, working the oh, night shift. So oh. in the early 2000s, if you ever came through Macca's at 3 a.m. <laughs> after a night out. I, I was spat probably, your cheeseburger. <laughs> <laughs> I probably gave you two extra McNuggets. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> again, math wasn't my skill point. <laughs> For those who um, don't know Brisbane well, I think Springwood was one of the first 24-hour McDonald's? One of the first 24s and one of the first with a mid cafe. And um, that was like you would literally drive from the city to Springwood to get a feed. Just, yes. just to get Maccas. Yeah, so, <laughs> and with the old 2 a.m. lockouts, it used to be very busy at three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, those beautiful old days. Okay. So Maccas is going great guns. Yeah. What happens then? I started uni for a year that I. Failed miserably at. What'd you study? Uh, sports management. I was trying to fix my OP because apparently back in the OP days, 19 wasn't a good number. Yeah, neither yeah. was neither was 18. Yeah. <laughs> Heard it from a friend. Learned the hard way that if you didn't put effort in for 12 years, it bites you in the ass. Um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, we're connecting. Yeah. <laughs> then I, at that point, I was trying to get into the army because family before real estate's all military. Mm -hmm. Like, my old man, my granddad, my uncles, my cousins, all in the UK, all, all serving. Was that a um, an expectation or was that you or everyone else is doing it, I should say? A combination of both. Mm -hmm. I think it was an expectation that we at least try. Um, was your dad going, well, maybe the military will fucking pull him in the arm? Yeah, <laughs> pretty, pretty much because <laughs> it fixed him up. But, yeah, the, the discipline and also the routine and structure, which... Whilst I hate it and I fight it all the time, it is my life, just routine and structure. Mm -hmm. um, and that that's what I wanted to do back then. Mm -hmm. um, tried to get into infantry officer training. Um, got kicked back two years in a row. So in that time, got married the first time mm -hmm. and then got divorced and then got into real estate. The real estate side of things. 20 um, years ago. 20 years ago. <laughs> Was that a, um, again, because your father was in it, but was that something that you, again, put on yourself or I can just do this and this will be an easy, an easy, not an easy gig, but because he's doing it, I can slide into this? No, probably the complete opposite. Yeah, Grew right. up seeing it and went, I wouldn't do that for you all the money in the world. What made, what turned you off it then? Seeing how much money real estate agents made. One of my, um, my father was training a, a guy I went to school with at the time um, who went from nothing and started earning some serious coin. And when you're working at Macca's for 16 bucks an hour, working <laughs> night shift, dealing with drunk people that are throwing things at you, vomiting, 
that kind of stuff. Like, man, the police used to have a lot of conversations. It would be like, he did this. Here's your cheeseburger. Stay here. Please stay. Um, it's still in the I'll car give you, park. I'll yeah. give you two free yeah. nuggets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who, who wants a free Coke? Uh, <laughs> so it was up, grow, growing up, never wanted to do it. It was never pushed on me. I, I think, well, the nice way to put it is my personality and then my drive. I made... Not a mistake, but old man needed someone to come work the front desk because his admin didn't show. Yeah. That was should have been the first warning. Um, real estate and staff and headaches. But I came off a night shift, went in, dressed up in a suit, answered some phones, and then never left. So um in between there, let's have a quick chat. Um Family? About six years. Um, so no, got married and divorced mm -hmm. real, real young, big learning curve. Probably the older I get, the more I see I was just young and should have listened to my parents, my friends, my family. Oh, but that's a wonderful thing. With my personality, it was what you we, didn't, you what know, like you being know? told yeah. what to do. Well, do you know, watch this. Um, and was a bit of a turd just because I didn't have any direction. Yep. Direction was a, a thing that's very, very much changed my life, which I can put down to my second wife. So what, <laughs> without jumping into answering other questions, what was the turning point then? The, the turning point would have been meeting Jody because I was still being a bit of a dick. I was early days in real estate, so starting to get a bit of a routine. And she didn't. Learn what money was. She liked you, but she didn't buy into that stuff. Pretty much. Was she but, not afraid straight straight away to say you're being an idiot? Yeah, she called me out on my bullshit. And she'd known me from the McDonald's days where I was still being a bit of a mm. a bottom feeder mm. and gave me an ultimatum and before we started dating. And it was kind of the best thing I ever did was go, okay, well, I can stop that, that, and that. Um Let's see where this goes. Yep. And then 15 years later, 13 married, two kids. 16 years, sorry. to apologize. 16 years. 16, Jody. Hi, Jody. 16, just Hi, check, Jody. checked my notes. 16 Hello. years. Hello. 13 years married in about 12 days. <laughs> it sounded yeah. like 16, <laughs> 16 15, yeah. but it was actually 16. Yeah, it was Mike, Mike interference. <laughs> just hang on. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So now... Fast forward to now, what are you currently doing at this present point in time? Still in real estate. I did mm -hmm. 10 years with my father's business mm -hmm. where I learned everything from the ground up to take over the family business, which we then sold and then moved across to another company. Are you grateful for having that cutting your teeth time with your father? Now, yes. At the time? At no. the time. I hated it because... Would, how many how many blues a week did you have? We're talking five or six a week, every week. <laughs> there was an argument on everything. Yeah. On Back then, I didn't understand why a full stop was so important on a brochure or why you'd use this photo <laughs> instead of that photo or why you'd get there 15 minutes early and not be late and why you'd polish and your shoes every day. And now, from knowing you, the time I've known you, they are staples. That, they, they are the backbone. It, it's you, what's kept me in the I industry. Think you've fucking ever been late for anything. No, <laughs> no. You, the rule is, if it takes half an hour, leave an hour. That way, if there's an accident, you're still 15 minutes early. I've been late once, but that was because the freeway was closed. <laughs> And I was already on the freeway. You couldn't, you couldn't get off said freeway. Yeah, I couldn't go four-wheel driving. But but the client did get a message saying, sorry, I'm caught in traffic. I will be there shortly and sent them an ETA and I was three minutes earlier than my ETA. Well, there you go. Yeah. Um, so real estate still now, I would, you know, hazard a guess to say you're quite successful at it. It, it took 10 years of training for my father to then become good at it. Do you see a lot in the real estate industry? Because um, we've had lengthy discussions about this. There are stigmas attached oh, to the real much estate much. industry. Does that, um, I guess, you know, shit you off a bit? Or do you go, actually, no, there's a lot of people where that's true, but I'm not one of them? Yeah. I used to fight it and think you could change people's perceptions and probably to my detriment tried to change people's perceptions. But the worst bit is, is, most of the stigmas out there are founded like the the industry 
unfortunately, 90% of the industry are below par and 10% of the industry actually take a bit of pride in their work and work hard and have a skill set. So once I realized you can't change people's perceptions, like I get, yep, just became me. So, which was a shock. Did you, um, cause like, you know, I, I, like I said, you're good at what you do. I've had a lot of practice. Yeah. How long, like you said, you had those 10 years with your old man doing, going out on your own. Do you find that you and your dad even still have conversations about it? We, we probably talk more now, which, which is scary. The moment he moved into state and I went out on my own, we went from having the, the required conversation or the required meeting every week to he, he's very much my mentor and coach still. I get check-ins, I report into him on good mm. weeks, bad weeks, good days, bad days, like still every, every yep. Saturday I get up. Good luck with your opens. I'm with your son in spirit, which is just a nice little. It's crazy. No, no, it, no, he's got my back. But for 10 years, I used to hate that. Now, now I live for it. I think that's the thing, isn't it? Like that little bit of distance sometimes is good. Yeah. Because, yeah, if, I mean, if you're living around someone and then you're working with them as well, there's just no break. Yes. 24 hours a day. <laughs> Beautiful hours. <laughs> so. Now living south side of Brisbane. Yes, in the deep south. The deep, deep, deep south. It's not that bad. He is, he is, he is Logan, but it's, an, it's a nice Davey part of Hill, Logan. Nice part of Logan, <laughs> yeah. Near, near the quarry and the koala reserve. And you, um, you are still working real estate, um, still very busy with it. Um, you've got Jody. you've got the girls. Yep, Abby and Emmy. And everything's... Good. Everything is good. Well, we have our challenges like everyone, but they're the reason I get up every morning. Well, so, we're going to get to that. Yep. <laughs> Which brings me on That's to... Segue, question. just... <laughs> nice. I like yeah. that. I like that. Which brings me on to number two. Three reasons you get out of bed every morning. It's not sad, but they're all around the same, same topic. So with my upbringing it's provide and protect and mm -hmm. my family and my world i don't do this for fun i do it to give them a certain life and lifestyle so jody and the two girls is the primary reason i get up even when i don't want to even when i'm sore and tired and run down and not feeling well doesn't matter if i'm not in hospital i go to work having a family in a job where you work a lot of weekends every weekend and late night late night yeah is that like and again i've never met your parents but not to pin it on the parents is that like you look at the way they parented and you go i don't want to do that but there is a part that i still, still need, to, need do. to do yeah yeah and that was probably the hard bit i, I grew up sitting there going i never want to be like my father and every morning I wake up and go bloody hell I'm like my father uh, <laughs> it's got a bit more hair um, <laughs> on top and no facial scars so th that's probably the, the motivation is uh di didn't want to do that to the extreme and we had to put some boundaries in place um and when, when things are tough at work because I'm the primary income earner mm. We all make the sacrifices. And the worst bit is it's probably the girls that make the biggest sacrifices. Um, but it is the drive. So then when I get the downtime, like Jody went to work post-COVID, I now do school drop-off four days a week, which yep. for the first two weeks, I went kicking and screaming, going, I'm not going to be able to make money. I'm not going to survive. It's going to be a detriment to the business, to taking the, oh, fuck it, I'm a dad. This, this is my job. It, it's my, is job. my job too. I now do it. So now I start later and work later. Like the job still happens. So. It's, it's not the it's not the amount of time. It's the quality, quality of, the of time. time. Yeah. Yeah. We have our little morning routine where I get my coffee. They go to Woolies, get a treat, a healthy snack. Yeah. Never, never yeah. anything sweet. Um, never donuts. Yeah. It's not donuts. Yeah. <laughs> or chocolates. Never Fredo frogs. <laughs> Always apples. Apples and blueberries. <laughs> but... It's probably that 45 minutes, four mornings a week. Mm. That is one of the most important 45 minutes. Like even when they're in a bad mood because they're nine and 10 and they're getting mm. challenging, it's still kind of the, the recharge of my system that I need. So when I finish at 10 p.m., I don't 
don't crash and burn. Yeah. And the, um, like I said, just just that amount of time, good or bad, Yeah, it's still time. It's still time, yeah. Um, with the work and what you have to do, I think it's very important that kids see their parents working yeah. so they understand that the money, not necessarily the money, but it has to come from somewhere. Yeah, and it's it not involved, magical. No, and it involves yeah. doing something. Yeah. So I know when we've been away together, you'll duck off for an quick, hour or two. Quick, quick hour, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> just do a little bit here and there. Yeah. But the other 23 hours... Yeah, we're there. You're on holidays with them. Yeah, I explained to them this is how they have their ice cream. If we're up at Coolum and we're going over to get a double scoop instead of a single soup, this I, made, I made a sale. So yeah. <laughs> double scoop time. So yeah, we we tried when they were younger. They they didn't understand. Well, they're, they're not meant they, to. It was just that that was the hardest bit. The getting the tears at night going mm. on the phone because mm. I couldn't be home and they wanted me home. Where now they start to understand. Yeah, they're figuring it yeah. out. Two and three? Two and three. My my need to provide and protect. Very much in my DNA. Tried to fight it when I was younger, but can't. Like uh, the way my parents brought me up and part of who and what I am is I have two roles in life and one's to provide for the family and one's to protect them. So if I didn't have them, I probably would be on some beach in Bali, passed out, to be honest. Um <laughs> Or in jail. Um, None, of yeah. yeah. None of it would have been good. Yeah. None of it wouldn't have been good. good. No. Um, you say provide and protect, and like again from a military background. So your father had a pretty um, what's the word? Higher profile role in the army. He did. Yes. Yeah. He was navy and then army, and got to a very high level, um, where he got to go overseas and do things that most people don't even know happened, and probably part of what made him him has been passed on to me, whether it was directly or indirectly, um, just from the way we were brought up and big believer that DNA does come into play. There's, mm -hmm. there's, there's certain things I'm good at that he was good at where I sit there and go, my little brother got more of my mum and he's musically talented where you mm. give me a recorder and... Yeah. It's bad. It's like in, <laughs> it's real bad. So like in Ferris Bueller's day <laughs> off, never had one lesson. Yeah, the, the, the lesson, yeah. <laughs> and that, that's probably a, a big thing because it, it is a part of who I am mm -hmm. and I tried to find it, but now I accept it and I think I'm better off for it. I think you're better off accepting Ooh. who you are as to trying to be something that you're not. It took a long time. Like, yeah, I've become a parent before or I had to before I came to that realisation. It's funny how you've said a few times now, so much stuff like when you were younger or those interactions with your father, you, at the time, you're just like, oh. yeah. but now you go. Now it all makes sense. I get yeah. it. And I probably apologize once a month to my parents. <laughs> so <laughs> when, when my girls are being challenging. What's what's your apology like? I'm sorry I was like I, a little I, shit. Just, yeah, I'm sorry I was a shit. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, that's pretty much it. Followed by, I don't know how you guys did it with four. Like, do they, do they answer? Is your mum actually able to answer that or does she say, I don't uh, know either? Oh, uh, <laughs> but it changes, depends on her mood <laughs> to the answer. But no, every time my girls can be a little bit challenged and they're like, oh, this is cute. <laughs> We've seen this before. This is fucking calm. Like, see, see your frustration? <laughs> that was your father. Um, Enjoy. Yeah. Yeah, so my, my little one's got a lot of me in her, which is good and scary at the same time. That's why she needs your training. Yeah, <laughs> she has got a bit of fight in her that Yes, life. just a little bit. All right, what else? Anything else getting up for? Oh, uh, the other one is just to give my girls the opportunity that my parents gave me. Like, it wasn't wasn't until I was older that I realised how many sacrifices my parents actually made. Like, we had a nice upbringing. We had a roof over our heads. We had food. We had clothes which seems silly, but between friends and other people I know, the, what I took for granted wasn't the norm and just wanted to make sure that, you know, my kids never mm. go to school hungry. Like, It's hard with kids, and we've, again, had a lot of discussions about this, 
them understanding that this stuff doesn't just fall out of thin air. Yes, just yes. A pair of Nike Airs isn't something everybody gets. Hey, Emily. <laughs> uh, <laughs> except for birthdays. And <laughs> when, when her father has sixty dollar runners and she wants hundred and forty dollar runners, <laughs> um, the work has to come into it. Do you um? Do you struggle? Because I'm I'm very much the same as you. Like like I. I, I recognize now being, young, well, when I was younger, how much my mother put on hold personally, personally so I yep. could have stuff that just, I thought, fell out of the sky. Yeah, from that magic tree out the back. Yeah, because yeah. it's just there, yeah. and that just appears. Do you, um, do you have trouble, and I know I do, have trouble drawing the line with that? Very much so, probably to my detriment. And and it's a very hard thing because I've I've had this conversation with people so many times. The definition of like spoiling compared to I just want them to have, to have yeah. things. Yeah. I don't want them to want for anything. Yeah. And that that that's probably one of the biggest conversations Jody and I have quite regularly is how do we keep that balance because we don't want to have spoiled kids, like where if we give them chores and we want to bring them up right. But I also don't want them to sit there and go, Oh, my school shoes hurt. Mm. Mm. Because there's kids at their school that have shoes from last year that hurt because their parents aren't in a position to get them where I sit there and go, well, I don't need new shoes. I'll go get you new shoes. You're growing. Um, yep. You've stopped growing because um, they keep and growing and getting bigger and bigger. But very, very hard balancing act because we don't want to spoil them. And probably now more than ever when we were kids, what you have now is so important. Yes. To the other kids. Yeah. Yeah. Brand names and, and that crap. And it was important where, when we were young. Or but nowhere when I there. Was young, but like now it's just out it, of control. It's mind blowing. Yes. It's not just Nike shoes. It's you've got to have this type oh, of Nikes. You've got to have your iPad for school, but you can't have the old model. No. Like you've correct. got to have like bloody Apple. <laughs> Like that, they've got you. new iPads. Fuck you, Apple. Uh, I've still got <laughs> an eight-year-old iPad I bought for work <laughs> that has a screen <laughs> um, and one of those fat chargers. Yeah, you know, not not the skinny charger. It takes charger. four minutes yeah. to change loads. Yeah. yeah, but it it's probably more important to them than it was with us growing up. But mm. yeah, it's kind of a bit scary how the world's going, where it's all got to be about the brand and the name. And we're trying to rein them in a little bit. Like, you don't need your Billabong shirt. You can have your Kmart shirt. You're going to wear it for six weeks and ruin it. Mm. doesn't need to cost me $100. No. It can cost me $14. So There's more and more of that case of FOMO, isn't there? Yeah. And I think with social media, with the young ones, because they're exposed to so much stuff now, it's it's just never turned off. But having, without ducking, well, this is a tangent, you would see that in real estate too. Oh, every day. You know, if you're not driving the Beamer and have oh, the... If you don't have the watch. The, 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 the Brett watch. Lang. And, yeah. You know. Yeah. Which is funny because the whole perception, and I'm a big believer, you've got to dress to impress. Mm. But there's also a, a level where I've, I've won appointments because I pulled up in my ute, <laughs> which it is a nice ute. It's not an old ute. It, it's a It's a fun ute. But the previous agent pulled up in a car worth more than their house mm. and they just went, You're what the? Kid. Yeah, what the? Didn't help that you had little man syndrome and other things going on, but mm. they liked the fact that I was a bit more real and they were like, why would you drive a ute when everyone else drives Beamers and Mercs and Porsches? And I'm like, because when I'm not working, I take the van out the and, caravan with and, it. and me and my family go have fun. <laughs> um, you can't do that in a sports car, yeah. which I did have. And it was fun, but <laughs> again, young and dumb. Part of your growing <laughs> yeah, up, growing up yeah. <laughs> When the kids couldn't fit in the back seat, it was time for a change. <laughs> and I got sick of cleaning yeah. up crush biscuits <laughs> out of the back seat. <laughs> yes, when you can't bend to get the vacuum cleaner in the back. <laughs> All right, let's go into number three. This is going to be interesting for you because I reckon you've got more no, than two. I, 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 uh, this is one of the lists. So thank you for my beautiful wife for helping me with said list. Two guilty pleasures that you have. That I'm allowed to mention on, on a podcast. So <laughs> no, look, back, back to our initial brief. Yeah. Yep. The first guilty pleasure is definitely my sweet tooth. Um, 
as you can tell, I'm a fighting fit mm. young young yeah, man. Right. Um, yeah, it's all right. But I do enjoy a little bit of sugar. It would be my probably worst addiction I deal with now um, to the point that I have emergency chocolate in my bottom drawer in the office. I have emergency chocolate in my bedside drawer. No, we have a okay. pack of Tim Tams at home that are just mine. My let's, Tim Tams. Let's go back. Define emergency. To, emergency. To, so there a need to be said emergency chocolate. Well, I have to restock it weekly. Okay. And by weekly, you so what's what's account. an emergency? Like what what occurs that you go fuck? I need the chocolate. <laughs> what? <laughs> um, <laughs> breathing. No, it. it it's one of our, I see it now as one of my coping mechanisms. Yep. I used to be a heavy drinker and heavy smoker. Because that um, leads me to my next thing. You don't drink. Don't drink. That's, no. that's a nine um, years drive. A moral decision more than a health decision. Both. A little bit both. of both. Yeah. yeah. Um, health enforced it. And now it's more moral because I've got to be a good dad. And how long you've been so before? Nine years. Nine long years. Before the <laughs> That's nine. <laughs> it's nine. Yep, definitely nine. We're uh, getting back to yeah. this. Now, I speak to a lot of people and have a lot of friends in recovery. What was that like? Was that just I woke up one day and this is uh, just what, and no, enough is enough? I, I woke up one day a little bit yellow and went to hospital, well, went to work because um, you go to work and then crashed at work, like my body crashed and I spent a week or two in hospital mm -hmm. um, while I was trying to work out what was wrong. And that was when Abby was about 18 months old. Emmy was about three months old. And probably the, the lowest point was in, in the hospital bed with my youngest on my chest and I was at bugger. I couldn't give her a hug. Yep. And that was because my body had just decided enough was enough. And by the time I got out a couple of days on the drip, always fixes you and some really strong painkillers and they just said well if you keep doing what you're doing back then it was you, you won't see the mid-30s um and now i'm 39 yeah, getting old <laughs> <laughs> and it was at the time was the easiest decision to make it was like okay well if i drop alcohol out and i get fit and i start start eating healthy that'll be fine at about week three that's when it really hurt because <laughs> did you it, go it, cold you went cold yeah. turkey I had one drink probably six months later because it was my 30th birthday and we're did, up at Hamilton. What did it taste like? Uh, it tasted beautiful. It was beautiful. Um, and I got halfway through my Canadian club and dry. Uh, um, and then my body just started closing down again. Already like, rejecting yep. it. Like to the point it, it took 20 minutes to get back to the room. Wow. And I spent five hours in the shower, curled on a ball, dealing with the pain. So for that small amount of alcohol for you to relapse, you must have been really fucked up. A little, yeah. Yeah, to for the point where. Better word. Yeah. <laughs> but now when people talk about going overseas, I'm like, hell, we should go over. I wonder if they have O-positive kidneys over there. Mm. Maybe I can grab two. Like, mm. make it a family trip. Pick um, someone in a yeah. car. <laughs> um, so the reason I jumped off onto that tangent um, a lot of people, you know, there would be people say guilty pleasures like yeah. a glass of wine and all the rest of it. You would be, you know, as again, people go, oh, you know, you have a lot of chocolate, you have a lot of sugar. It's like, yeah, well, I can do that and still be alive. And still function. <laughs> yeah. And I'd, I'd probably still miss it if anyone lies to you and say they don't miss it. Like, I think that's bullshit. Yeah. Drugs and alcohol, you, you miss, you always will miss, but. It, it was a conscious decision. It was just backed up by the body, which is good. You talked earlier about Jody being your voice of reason. Yes. Was she, um, well, definitely was involved in the conversation, <laughs> but was it a situation like you need to do something about this or this is going to really affect us the, as a family? The conversation. If you get my drift. Start, yeah, the conversation <laughs> started like that, um, but I don't think she realised I was beating myself up more inside anyway. Yeah. Because, again, going back to that provide and protect, that was probably one of my lowest, lowest moments because mm. I will sit there and give my life for my kids. But mm. if you're in a hospital bed and you can't lift your arms up, you can't do much yeah, for them. You're useless. And that that was a big thing. And also seeing the, the shock on her face, I, I think she was when we're in the hospital at the worst bit, she was sitting there looking at me like I wasn't coming out. Yeah, yeah. And that that's where I felt like I failed. Was the... um, And we don't fail. We like, don't fail. Yeah, we don't fail. I'm trying to think of the words. So 
were you a uh, were you a chocoholic, sugaraholic prior to drinking? I enjoyed, prior to quitting drinking. I've always enjoyed my sweets, but never to that level. It, it was a replacement, um, like like old habits. Mm. Uh, oh well, if I can't do this, I still need something to feel good. Um, because so. again, back to and I like I, I warned you, we jump off on a lot of <laughs> do, yeah. Um, alcohol and other things, yep. stuff in the real estate industry. Oh, it was massive. Are you yeah. like the fucking spare dick at a wedding when pretty, it comes to fucking shit? Much. <laughs> pretty much. But are you starting to see maybe now more people not drinking? It, it's be- probably in the last two, three years, it, it's becoming less of a weird thing mm-hmm. like because well, how was it when you because you were working just, in real it, estate it was just round upon it was like you're broken there's something wrong with you or like and, what, and i literally was it was but what's fucking wrong with you yeah, just have a drink yeah and, and it, the, the peer pressure was like just have another one just, you just have one i'm like you don't understand i like 18 year olds i will fucking die i will i will do a bottle i've got no issue with that <laughs> um but if i do my life insurance better pay out um <laughs> and it like the the most industries are riddled with it, but mm. alcohol in particular, it's just you go to you have a win, I'll have a drink. You have a shitty day, I'll have a drink. Mm. It's a Tuesday, I'll have a drink. Um, and prior to getting sick, I didn't realize how bad, and I'll call it an addiction now. When I was younger, I was like, that's just what everyone did. Like, hundred percent. Rent was three hundred dollars. My, well, it was a bloody first choice liquor back in the day, but that was about 350 bucks a week. It was just like, well, you paid your rent, yeah, then you got your drinks, the rest is play and, money. Yeah. And when I was younger, it wasn't wasn't a problem, everyone did it. Mm. But as I got older, I went, no, I was a raging alcoholic and I didn't know it. Yep. Um, again, like you talk about like looking back on things now because I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> was that the nineties? We are, man. You can't. It's the one thing you the can't 90s, prevent. Yep. You can't prevent age. Um, was that something that you look back on now? I wouldn't say it was a peer. Was it a peer thing more than a family thing? That, oh, there was a lot of peer pressure, but it was more more the family. That was my reason that I wasn't going to cave because. Mm. Again, the the moment you become a dad, I think everything changes, mm. um, and that was a massive realization, and probably didn't help because that happened, and then I drank more because I'd become a dad, and you had to we went from two incomes to one, and yeah. there was a different level of stress, and that probably sped things up. But yeah, young and dumb, just young and dumb. Yeah, now we're just older. Yeah, now now we're old and less dumb, but more <laughs> dumb. <as well. laughs> All right, give me, is there a second guilty pleasure? There is that I'm allowed to talk about, um, which is my my fishing rod collection and gear collection, which <laughs> apparently is slightly excessive. But if you ever want to go fishing, let me know, because I've got everything. <laughs> <laughs> you can't go to BCF or Anaconda and not buy a rod. Like, I, I, I can, I can, nice. I can. Like, I can. I, I'll go to get something for the van and be like, oh, shit, a new rod. Yeah, I need one of them um, to go with the other 27. (laughs) Do you actually catch any fish with them? I don't. I probably go fishing once a year. I used to do it all the time, but I like to be prepared. You can only use one rod at a time. Oh, no, you can use four when when you're smart. You just lay them out. Rod rod holders, yeah, because you don't know what's going to be biting, where you're going to be going, so many variables. (laughs) See, it's funny, like me growing up, fishing was equated to drinking. Yes. So my best mate's dad would go out fishing and we'd say, drunk. well, we'd say, Billy, how was the fish? And you go, bottle of rum. Yeah. That meant there was no fish. <laughs> yeah, no fish yeah. It's half a bottle of rum. And he actually had yeah, to do caught, some fishing caught, there. Yeah. There was some work being done. Um, but yeah, mate, I go to BCF. Um, hello to all our friends at Yeti. No. Um, I uh, I buy my Yeti yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, he's a bear yeah. proof. Which is bear proof. Yeah, would you bear, believe? It's bear yeah. proof. We're getting off track again. Um <laughs> Keep your drinks cold for 24 hours. I know, man. It's good. It's good. Not that I have to drink last 10 minutes. Yeah. So, but like, you know, well, you're, what are you, what are you on 14 or 15 cans of Coke a day? What are you on? Sometimes 20. It's like, it's, it's appropriate. <laughs> we swap addictions. Um, <laughs> Look, we are all addicted to something. It's just what you choose what to is. be addicted to. Yeah. All right. Very much so. Okay. Number four. One thing that you bought. Has literally made you happy every day after. This is going to make me sound wankery. That's all right. Guaranteed. That's right. This my my gold chain. Okay. Why? About, 
18 or oh, 16, 17 years ago now, because I'm getting older, my old man went away for a wedding in the UK and mm -hmm. left me running the office with his stock bank, um, which is available properties for sale for those not in the industry, <laughs> um, which was a very big thing. My father wasn't very good at letting go, thus I'm not very good at letting go, um, but had to happen. And I think in two weeks, I sold six properties and sold my first property over a million dollars. Yeah. The moment that settled, I got paid and I walked into a jeweler and bought this because I'd always wanted a proper gold chain, not one of the fake ones, not one of the silver field, not the sand field, like proper solid gold chain and spent my entire, back then, because we got paid by checks, <laughs> entire commission check on a gold chain to the point where I had to use savings to buy pay for rent at the time. So, but it was uh, just uh, an accomplishment. I'd wanted it. I, I did have to bleed with work a bit in that that period because I got left in charge of something that I knew was very important to my father Yep. Um, with some clients that were very important to him and did what was needed, including a couple of 16-hour days back to back, which and that, takes a toll. So, and this reminds me of it every day. But is that that's a good thing for you yeah. because you learn how, well, if, and again, look, we're talking about teaching kids. If you work hard, you get get rewards. This, yeah, yeah. We, and that we can, like to be very goal driven because that can equate to anything. Like it can equate to that that gold chain. It can equate to a car. It can yeah. equate to that. Like, and I think you know having something like that is you know that constant reminder. Mm. This is what happens if you work hard. Yeah, yeah. Effort and reward because again, the money doesn't grow on the trees. Mm. But just every day, see it in the mirror. Think God, I'm lucky. So that's good, man. Not that's just good. good looking, but I have a chain. It's just... <laughs> you guys getting? Are you I'm guys getting used to this? Yeah, <laughs> just a little bit of confidence. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One thing everyone thought you were crazy doing. <laughs> One thing would be like, Fuck Why, yeah. yeah. But did it anyway, and it paid off. So you can't list the forty-five things you did that yeah. were crazy that yeah, didn't pay off. The... <laughs> Oh, you wanted to pay off. <laughs> Let me just amend the note. No, the the one thing that oh, everyone, including myself, thought was crazy was probably getting married for the second time because I was still young when we got married mm -hmm. for the second time. Um, and Jody's another redhead, so sucker for pain and punishment. But hi, Jody. Hi, Jody. <laughs> hey, yeah, Pr probably the the best best thing that's ever happened like I, I thought I'd been happy prior to and I think it's not until you go through three things that aren't enjoyable that you don't appreciate the good things can I ask without sounding whether she gave permission for this she didn't about this one no, <laughs> she didn't see this note the gap between divorce and remarrying no, I was about or three and a half years. Okay. And I was still, yeah, I was, I think I was 23 or 24 when we got married. So you wouldn't say, like, how am I, I'm trying to. I was still paying off my divorce when we got married. So you were kind of. Oh, we just, I just paid it off. Rebounding. But then the were you. rebounds. <laughs> were you in a, were you in a mindset? I'm never fucking doing this yeah. again. Yep, didn't know why why people would do it. Um, like I, I did it because I was young and in a different space, and then something went, went. Why would you? you? You're crazy. And I think I knew within about three months of us dating that I was in for a lot of pain because I was going to be doing it all over again. But it was uh, if we do this. It's an all or nothing. It's not a in a few years' time. If it doesn't work, that's it. It was a mm. this won't not succeed. Do you think there was something in Jody's head because you were um what's the word you were, you were a used car? <laughs> yeah. Um damaged goods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Repairable ride off. Was I there the insurance? Like, like, whatever else, else, call it. Whatever <laughs> else you want to yeah. call it. Was there something? Do you think there might have been something there with Jody? There, there was a lot of probably a lot of hesitation, which and was that probably from her friends or side of the family as well? Yeah, yeah, a bit of both, just because it wasn't just oh, that you're I, all I fucking Brad. Yeah, I've heard about it. It wasn't just that, but it was also <laughs> the the damaged goods mm. stuff. And going going back, like 
divorce didn't become cool until like 15 years ago. Mm. <laughs> mm. So there's a lot of things I did before. And you was... probably can't, like in all seriousness, you probably can't blame them for thinking that way. No, no. The older I get, the more I sit there and go, God, I'd do yeah. say if my kids came home and said, 100%. He, here's my new boyfriend, he's divorced and and he looked like me, I'd want to beat him up too. I mean, when my my parents got married, my father had already been married and he started dating my mother whilst everything was getting finalised. And they hadn't been together for a long time. But um, this is like mid-70s, early 70s. Back when it was a fucking big deal. Like in in my family, it was was a big deal, Mm. you know. It's crazy how it's gone full circle. It used to be very taboo. Now it seems the mm. thing that everyone does, they go, well, it's been boring for a year, so and we might as well. joked yeah. about now, isn't it? Oh, 50% yeah. of them fail anyway. Yeah. yeah. You know, I don't With, want it to. No, but I, I think no one's willing to put in the effort. Like the second time round, we've had more ups and downs than most people. So what, what you know, without trying to get delve too, too deep, deep, Yeah. why has this one worked and the other one didn't? My maturity. De- it's definitely. It's definitely a yeah, definitely, you it, problem. It was, it was a, a me thing. Yeah, but <laughs> it wasn't one of those things where people go, oh, it's not you, it's me. And and that I I take full ownership on the first one. I was, I was a shit. Mm. Um, and, you know, second time round wasn't going to not learn by my mistake. So yeah. it was a... a, a a big decision to get engaged, even though I did it half drunk in Thailand at PP Island um, after a couple of Long Island iced teas lying on a beach. But there's, there's worse places that, to do it. There was a lot of prep work that went into. <laughs> yes, this is going to actually actually be the be the thing. And I probably the big thing is when you find find the one, it's hard to explain because we're now in a a society where it's oh I'll swipe here or I don't like this one or I'll, I'll go me a brunette or I'll. I'll change up hell, I'll go something that doesn't identify, mm. where it was just new. Would um when you said when you uh proposed I was so drunk. <laughs> so drunk. Was Jody on board straight away? Yeah, we 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 had broached the I'd broached There'd the subject. Conversations. Yes. yes, I wasn't. Again, don't fail. Um, because that's not how I was brought up, but I wasn't making that call without knowing the answer I would get. And well, I'm 90% sure there's still that yeah, still down in the back of your head going. <laughs> she says no, and I get stuck on the island, and I don't speak Thai, yeah. and she's got the bag that's got the money in it with the passports. I'm screwed. Um, she's got to be yeah. able to order a cab and order a beer. Well, this is before when you banged up a board existed. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, there, there, there had been conversations over but we, we'd had the conversation of if we get married awesome and then do you want kids do I want kids if so how many what yeah. do you want your life to look at which when we were in Jody was very very early 20s and I was less early 20s but mm. it was there were some pretty serious conversations and went this is the path we want to go and Jody's younger than you yeah so three and a half years younger okay so an 88 vintage good good vintage that year um. <laughs> yeah i was in high school um, <laughs> so so that was also probably something too you were a older b divorced divorced yep now had a real job like what well, was not making great money in real estate because the first couple of years you don't but could see the trajectory of hell if i do this this yep. and this it'll it'll pay off and it was like if we're going to go on this journey I want you there. Do you want to be there? But knowing because she'd only ever known me as a real estate agent, mm. knew about the crappy hours. Like mm. we joke about it now, but the kids, if I come home early on a Saturday, the first thing they say is, did you make a sale? Because if I come home early on a Saturday, I haven't made a sale. I shouldn't be home. Um, and that's from a nine and 10 year old. Because <laughs> they know where the money comes from now. But Those kids are smart. Yeah, they're, they're very smart. But <laughs> It just used to be text messages. Hey, we're working on a deal, probably going to be late, followed by that was at 5 p.m. to at 9 p.m. I would text her and say, I'm still trying to close this out. Don't know what time I'll be finished. And at no point did she ever hold that against me. I never got any. That was part of the yeah, contract. Yeah, that, that was just part of 
what she signed up for, unfortunately, but the rewards came through. Mm. So. I think that's the thing with um, relationships. Like I think for the first, COVID was interesting for us because COVID was the first time since Helen and I got together that we spent time together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That I was not working in some capacity pretty much every night. Yeah, there's a reason why a lot of people got divorced out like, yeah. during COVID. And, after. and I look luckily we we relished it. It was so great just to be at home. But yeah, when Helen and I first started dating, I worked every weekend. Yeah. You know, and that's what she signed up for. She didn't sign up for COVID and having you at home. It was like, fucking, it was it was probably like you look back now and you're like you're probably the same. You look back and go, you know, no wonder like you know, like that was really that must have been really tough. Mm. Yeah. You know, even you look back to yeah. your father, you know, and then our partners, you go, God, that must have just been like just so tough, us always being out away. Yeah. Yeah, that would suck. Oh. They definitely got the harder job. Horrible. All right. Now, okay, question six. <laughs> Four things you cannot live without, animate or inanimate. I had to Google what those two were. <laughs> then. Um, <laughs> Sorry, that, going back to that wonderful Alive word. Google, I was like, <laughs> I was using these big words. Yeah, there I go again. Mine, uh, very much family driven again. So the wife and children mm -hmm. could not live without them. Caffeine, because not having the alcohol, the caffeine. Go to coffee? Ah, uh, a mocha. mocha. Love a mocha. I love it because I got the sweet taste, a little bit of chocolate oh. with an extra shot oh. of coffee. Yeah. That That's a way to go. On normal milk, like I don't know if I'm allowed to call it normal milk, but what is normal milk man? from cows? Like, oh. not squeezed so over. Milk doesn't nut. come from no. almonds or the no, <laughs> or coconuts <laughs> or it's pretty much just normal full cream. And, and what's sad is now I get those funny looks. It's like, oh, you want full cream? Yeah. It's like, fucking yes, weirdo. Yes, I want, I want fucking milk. <laughs> <laughs> so that stuff that came out of a bean, that ain't milk. <laughs> Are you um, small or large? Medium. I like to go medium because yeah. I, I wake up, have one. I hop in the car, have one, and then that gets me through till about lunchtime. Then, depending on how my trajectory is looking for the evening, depends on whether it's a two or three in the afternoon. Like, a, a, so how many do you talk in a day? Probably five comfortably. Jesus. And you only ever see me when I'm not riding my caffeine high. I like, can help. On the holidays, it's like two coffees a day. I know. I'm just gonna, which is hard to operate. But that's why I'm more subdued. Would you say, um, now, do you make your coffee or are you a buy-it-out guy? 50-50. Okay. Because of the volume, I have to buy, make some to afford the ones I buy. <laughs> um, otherwise, I'd be spending 300 bucks a week for coffee. Um, but, yeah, kind of a 50-50. All right. All right. Nothing beats a good instant coffee at 9 o'clock in the office where you sit there and go, i got to get home. <laughs> I need enough pick me up to get from Wollongabba to Daisy Hill. Can you imagine, like, again, our parents used to have just in coffee out yeah, of that, fucking that Nest Cafe stuff. Yeah, oh yeah, that, that was the best one. And, um, and the uh, Nest Cafe Gold that was the yeah. oh, you guys are doing yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. Someone's got a bit of coin behind <laughs> me. You went the three dollar tin, hey? Jesus, <laughs> God, none of that international roast crap. Yeah. All right, got another one. Yeah, pets or one dog at the moment. I'm very much an animal person. Is it a dog or a horse? Borderline. She's only, oh, she's 42 kilos. So okay. the kids could ride up. What um, breed of dog is this? We're currently looking after a Great Dane. We're a year into dog sitting because mm -hmm. our, our little fluffy things passed during COVID. And when the Great Dane's parents come back, if we give them back or we'll give her back, <laughs> um, we'll probably look at getting a couple of shepherds so i need i need dogs at home they're they're happy when you wake up they're happy when you get home their love is unconditional yeah and they get so excited over food oh god and we're all feeders we, we like to hide it but you give a dog yeah. a treat <laughs> you saw my dogs earlier like, yeah like i'm like where the fuck did yeah, you got shit got, got <laughs> home and got to your house and it was like I was getting the look. <laughs> it's like, you're not dad. <laughs> you don't have as much hair. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't try and bite me though. So no, 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 good, good, good sense of character. They're fucking 
We got any more? Oh, last one, and this one was approved by the wife, would be, according to my wife, it's control. Okay. That apparently, and even though I'll deny it, um, I like to be in control of my environment, my circumstances, where I am. Which when she told me that, I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so you said when Jody told you that, is that something that you don't think you are, but when you sit back, you go, so yes, well, upon reflection, I like yeah. would you call yourself, you wouldn't call yourself a control freak? Not yet. Okay. So what's pulling, what's keeping you from being a control freak? Are you, do you do you do you have a capacity okay, to wing it still? I'm probably a borderline control. Okay, freak. I'm just yeah, I'm yeah. just just saying. So, I'm trying to it depends, pick this apart. Depends in which aspect of life. So with, with work, my biggest issue is I don't let go, and I've got a team, and I do jobs I shouldn't do that I should delegate, but I don't. Because, Why is that? Because I sit there, and whilst I I've got a good team behind me, I. I sit there and go, well, if they stuff up, then i got to fix it. So why didn't I just do it? No, even though they don't stuff up. I think it. any, and this is, again, like I've studied a lot about management and leadership, and I do it in here. And I've always been told nobody will love your business as much as you. The way you do. You. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's probably the thing in, in my line of work, like your line of work. If you don't bring your A game, you don't make money. Hmm. If you don't make money, you don't pay the mortgage hmm. or the car lease. And the buck stops yeah. with you. And you can't sit there and go, oh, well, my boss did this or my company did that. It, it is you. And How do you think you would go, like you report to people, but how do you think, would you ever go back to just being a, an employee or you don't think I, you could I, do it? I wouldn't survive. And that, that's probably the, the hard bit. And, and, it come, and again, comes down to control. What I sit there and go, I'm still relatively young in the industry because I've only done 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of oldies out there that are, doubled and more than that the real estate industry now people have got lucky to be in for oh, five and they jump out three yeah yeah because everyone watches the tv shows and thinks it's yeah um, it's um not fucking yeah. a list sydney yeah. whatever like you just don't want to give me five million dollars <laughs> oh, oh okay. i gotta work for you, you don't want me to sell your house i gotta um, work past yeah. five o'clock <laughs> You learn to love rejection. Uh, <laughs> remember, the first hundred no's means you're a little bit closer to a yes. Uh, so that I, I couldn't just because of probably the way I was trained yep. and because dad, dad was over the top and I didn't understand them, but now I do. And like one of the masters in the industry where I couldn't lower my, the standard I keep myself to versus the industry average or even a lot of good ones is mm. a much lower standard than what I could sleep with. Mm -hmm. Like I couldn't go home and go to sleep. Yeah. But I'll make a sale this afternoon, which I would have made last night, but the bar wasn't quite ready. So we're, we're still working that process. And I would want nothing more than on my birthday to go home, have an early night, have dinner, and I'll, I'll still get home for dinner, but I will make this sale. Because the client's trusted me and she's a beautiful little old lady too. Mm. So we'll, we'll make that sale where I couldn't go to someone else who go, oh, we'll just get back to that on, on Wednesday. It's like, no, mm. no, no, mm. a job, do job. This is what I do. Yeah, it, it's, it sounds sad, but the things we do as standard uh, seem the, the perception from the industry, but the clients we work with sit there and get blown away for us answering our phone or returning a call. And like nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, like, you guys have been past clients. If well, anytime you call me, you saved to my phone or an answer. But throughout that process, because it's so stressful, I've had clients call me at quarter past one in the morning because they've got home and had a break in mm. on a Saturday morning, and, and they go, know. "What? What do I do?" They don't know, what and they haven't called the police yet. Is but that... they know if they call me, I will answer because that's part of my promise. Is if you need me, you call, I will fix your problem. That's what you pay me to do. Is that very? Um... I guess, humbling. Very much so. When, Especially when people don't expect it to be true. In the industry, it's all bullshit. They all, all talk a big game. They all have their fancy watches. Because there's so much cars. voice out there now with, oh, with real estate. It, it's sad. Because, it, like, again, yeah. 30, 30 years ago, I mean, I don't know the figures, but surely there's, well, there's a lot more houses for starters. Yeah. So there's a lot more people needed to sell them. Lot, yeah. And, a lot more volume, but it's probably the the 
big eye opener is like, I think about 3% of the industry does about 80% of the business. Crazy, so there's a lot of people that will do one, two, or even 10 deals a year that call themselves real estate agents. They're going to have much better social media than me. They're going to have TikToks every day. They're going to have so many posts. But you're not going to that market. No. Well, we all, how I was taught is your, your client comes first. You're yep. here to provide a service. What they do with that service and that advice is up to them. Yeah. But learning to put the client first, like I, I've walked away from deals because it wasn't in the client's best interest. I was just about to say, have you had deals or clients, like have you had a client that you've just gone, this is too hard? Yeah, I've had a couple. Like where I'm a little bit pickier than I was when I was younger because you just needed to just survive. Just to make the sale. Where now, now we will walk out of an appointment and go, you know, this even if they do want to work with us, this isn't worth it, it, it ain't worth it because what they're going to want, what they're going to demand, what they want is I want this, but I want to pay this. Mm. And they go ask 10 people, someone will buy them all and go, yeah, I'll do it for that. And it's more the self-respect. Like we're... My, my second in command has six, seven years under her belt and is probably better than two thirds of the agents in the industry mm. because of how well trained she is, her attention to detail, like she's all my weaknesses. And we we have a line that we will say, this isn't, it's just not worth the time. There's plenty of other agents out there that will do it. And often what happens is they go with that option. Three months later, we go, and they call you back. <laughs> yeah. And then, then they want more because they've spent money and done it the wrong way and didn't listen to any of the advice. And we can come in and fix that. Mm. But there's a fee, fee associated with it. And everyone has this big, you know, oh, commission, you earn too much and you pay too much. But we work hard. Like, And I think this is any industry, and I talk about it in here, you know, martial artists in general are classically underselling themselves. Oh, something fierce for their skill. Like your guys' skill set. It's mm. not like you went, oh, I'm going to be a martial artist. Well, and this is the thing. 10 minutes later, you've got your own. 100%. And like, so how long have you been in the industry now? 20 years. <laughs> so, you know, 20 years in the military, what rank would you, would you be? You know, 20 well, years in the would be dead, no, no, no. My personality. Okay, so that was a bad example. Yeah. That was yeah. a bad example. But I, like... I would have got three years and then got dropped. Um, yeah. 20... Gone, oh, I'm not bulletproof. He'd, he'd, be, a, he'd be a mercenary yeah. in some West African country. Oh, um, no <laughs> but that amount of time, you can't, yeah. that experience, you can't, like that just you doesn't appear. It, yeah. and, and that's what a lot of people don't understand. Like I, I'll, I'll help colleagues put together deals that, seem like they won't come together and it's not that i'm amazing at my job it's i've had Just to overcome longer it. than you. yeah I had to overcome and know how to read the play like we had a deal last year that took six weeks to close but right. when they first put their offer in to when the owner finally accepted it was six weeks of back and forth and we bridged a four hundred thousand dollar gap now most people sit there and go oh the buyers come in 500 grand under what the owner wants it's a waste of time and just let it go and again, this client had been referred to me and it was more on principle and mm. it was a unique property, but it was like, no, no, I'll just chip away. If I can get another 25 from here and get this one down five, mm. we're now only $380,000 apart mm. um, and, and working at it. And then we've had other other deals. We did one just before Christmas where sold the property to the only client the owner told us not to sell it to um, <laughs> because of a, a family family rivalry. Um but the price and terms made them a standout client yeah. and we got the deal done. Yeah. I'm willing to let so, that yeah, go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a certain price. For it. And it's sad, but money makes the world go around. There's mm. a certain number and it's the same with our business. There's a certain number where it's not profitable for us to do the, what we do and how we do it. And I used to not value my time where now compliments mm. of my wife and children, I value it immensely. They're so Fucking smart, these wives of ours, aren't they? Yes. We were only talking about this on the weekend because we're doing stuff here and like moving forward. And yeah, it's it's your time. Mm. You know what? You know what? What dollar value do you put on your time? No, what wives are the smarter ones? I hate it when they're right. Yeah, <laughs> just like all the time. What I love is when husbands won't admit it. I'm like, yeah, just fucking every suck week it up. in my job. I'm like, Take you're, you're not the decision maker, Helen. What would you want? To do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, well, you yeah, know, it's you didn't talk to me, did didn't you? Have you to. Yeah, to did not have to. <laughs> 
All right. If you were not doing what you're doing in life right now, oh God, what would have been option number two? <laughs> option. Death is death is not an no, option. Yeah, no. No, I can completely say I wouldn't have got here. Um, <laughs> it, it would have been the army. I I would have gone back again and again till I got in and lowered my standards. It was just that. My father told me you don't go in as a grunt, you go in, do opposite training and, mm. and do it the right way. And I got knocked back a few times straight out of school and probably was smart on their behalf. Okay. Um, they do could they could ever, see things. <laughs> do you ever do the parallel universe thing? And like if I had gone in the army, you wouldn't have met Jody. Oh yeah. Yeah, all the yeah. time. What 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 would have been like if we were to jump into that sliding doors moment? Let's say you've got in what? God, in I probably would have seen three to five years gone overseas and got shot. Hopefully for a good cause, and just because of the way I was brought up and, and what the army offer from us. Uh, so you would have still had that protect thing. Yeah, just would have. It just would have been a different. Yeah, just. <laughs> it just would have. Died. Just would have got shot. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm still pretty sure I'm allergic to bullets, but we haven't tested that. Right. Most people are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the way the world's going, I might get tested no. too. Than that, but... <laughs> what, um, like a military family and then you moving into real estate? I think I know the answer to this, but was there ever a, uh, you should have joined the army or you should have persisted more with that? Or no, not from the family. Probably because without going into it, your father probably saw a bit of action. Was he probably glad that you didn't go into the military? I I think while whilst he helped support our goals, he didn't want like didn't want us in it. Like because it, it's literally a the family tradition. Mm. Um and Are your parents Australian born and bred? Mum is. Mum's as Aussie as you can get. Dad's at Pommy. Yeah. So it was Pommy and then came out. So British. So we're talking British yeah. Army? British Army, yeah. Mm. And saw a lot of things, but I think from indirectly even our upbringing, it was just because of how he was trained. We were trained. It's all and need. it's, yeah. And it was like, well, if you're going to do it, do it well. And just remember, you don't, you don't lose. You said it, you had two brothers? Yes. Two brothers and a sister. Them yeah. going into the military was never a... Th thing oh uh, my my younger brother wanted wanted to he wanted navy from memory but um didn't get in um and then tried a couple of times so the other two siblings had no interest but i think that's because of again going back to that dna that that drive and that want yeah and i think the big thing for me when i was younger it was just that whole that unity that whole you know brothers and arms mm -hmm. someone's got your back you don't mm -hmm. worry about you you worry about the man beside you type thing which is a bit glorified but that that was appealing like we've all watched mm. our share of movies and we go fuck that'd be cool yeah and yeah, as that... your father probably said it's cool till someone's actually Shot, shooting yeah. at you <laughs> yeah i think saving private ryan that opening scene got got dad and said that's very realistic and then the movie black hawk down that was the first time dad went what the fuck yeah. Like that, that actually showed because prior to that, it was it was a glorification. It, yeah, how wonderful is this? You know, no mm. bad guy can shoot straight. Mm. Um, they've all got the same guns, and no one's got straight bullets. Where like in those movies, like especially when Dad had his quieter moments, it was like people That's... people don't understand how realistic that is. That some of those some of those scenes are mm. that are, are pretty full on. So, not again tangent jumping um your father and the way he is and the way you were raised um definitely a level of ptsd there oh yeah i i don't think he'll he'll ever admit to are there first, things that just you don't you just, just, don't, just don't talk you just about. don't talk about like there, there's been because when did he when did he finish up in the military well i was born in 85 so probably 83 because <laughs> okay. he had to come over to australia and meet mom so getting a real estate um because so without estate. jumping into a history lesson british military at that time would have 70s. been involved in some yep 70s and early 80s some so yes yeah, yeah. foreign and domestic yeah yeah but yeah close to home and far away and yeah it, it, he's definitely got got traumas which but comes from a vintage where it's you don't talk about it mm. like i've still i was brought up as real men don't cry hard mm. enough you know, you don't have, not that you don't have feelings, but it's, you have certain roles and responsibilities and you will just deal with it. Yeah. Um, 
which is very different to friggin' 2023, 2024, where mm. now I can paint my nails, dye my hair and call myself something else. And that's completely fine. Um, and I think we've gone too far the other way, but it was just a, this is your role. This is what you do. And you, when you come back, mm. that was while you're away, you're now home mm. and like ha having friends and that, that have served that have come back and come, some have come back broken. Yep. It's at not being able to talk to people yep. and pe people just not understanding because everyone watches a movie and goes, oh, that'd be fun. Yeah. How like, that? We'll throw a grenade at the tank. Woo. Yeah. Um, well, that's why I said, uh, ne uh, never I seen a real tank in real life coming at me, but I I'm guessing you would shoot yourself going, that's a tank. <laughs> it's like, uh, on a, on a much probably different scale, people in here will talk about things like jujitsu or sparring. I'll say, oh, you know, this is great. And I said, yeah, pad work stuff's fine. And then the pad starts fucking hitting your back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a controlled safe environment. That's, yeah. that's a lot different. That's yeah. something you can't control. Um, yeah, the safe space versus out there. Was him leaving the military his choice or was it his time was done? I believe so. Like he he, he was okay. still young when he left. Yeah, um, yeah, and without going into massive detail, I think some of it was medical related because there's only so many times you can yeah. be sewn up. Yep. <laughs> um, yep. And then you can go out and become a very successful real estate agent with some cool scars. Um, That's a very... That's a very interesting, you know, segue. Like, yeah. yeah, I'm trying to like, you know, did that fall into his lap or was that just, well, fuck it, I'm going to start selling houses? No, I think it was survival. So it, like when he came out to Australia, uh, like outside of the military, the family owned pubs and restaurants. Yep. So he worked in a pub and restaurant and mm. then I guess just fell into real estate. It's probably the, the best and worst bit about real estate is it's highly addictive and there's still that sense of going for the kill. Like the difference between what makes an okay agent and a great agent is being able to sit there and know mm. when do you go for the kill, which is a not a nice word to use, but that there's a moment in any negotiation in, my, in most things in life. It's just, you've got to know when to go for it yep. and you've got to be willing to take it. And you've got two outcomes that either pays off and high fives or you crash and burn and you start again. So have, have you done sales? I'm sure you have over 20 years. I will sell anything. You want the van sold? But have you done sales <laughs> where you just like, not that it was, I'm trying to like done sales where you just go, that was fucking horrible. Oh yeah. I'll, I'll, I, I'll and, rue the day I ever committed to this. Yeah. And had ones where you go, that's in the bag, and then it's not in the bag, and you find out how beautiful termites can be to homes. <laughs> like we've had, I've had a property on the market for three and a half years, and I was the fifth agent to take it on, and eventually sold it. I, it was viewed as the unsellable listing, but I, do I, you like that challenge? I the challenge, yeah, unsellable my ass. Because there, there were people that had tried and failed that were good. There were some more than below average agents that had given it a shot, but mm. it was just having that right direction, and, mm. and it was a combination of timing, finding the right person, yeah. and bringing it together. It wasn't a little deal; like it was multi million dollar deal. But at the end of the day, to sit there and go, <laughs> I did it. <laughs> Oh, like, and no, you motherfucker! I know you guys tried, um, <laughs> but I did it. Um, that, that's mine. Um, clearly, clearly, which not is a, wrong. yeah, which is it's nice, very, very nice to do. What um is that? Do you think one? We'll, we'll get back on track, but is that one reason you think there is such a short lifespan for agents these days? Yeah. Yeah, the, the burnout for anyone who wants to survive is so high because it, even 10 years ago, like working... Back to the throwing grenades yeah, at a tank. It's not as cool as yeah. they thought yeah, it would it, be. It looks cool in the movies, but there's, there's no separation. Like everyone talks about work-life balance and it's a beautiful thing and the, the billionaires of the world say, mm -hmm. just find something you love and you'll never work a yeah, day in your life. Which fucking bullshit. It's like, okay, Jeff, yeah. will you give me a couple of billion? I, I'll I find say, something I like. I say this to the kids in here um, every time, like, you know, they have a hard lesson or whatever. I said, karate wasn't hard or jujitsu or Muay Thai. It wasn't hard. It's not hard. It was just hard today. Yeah. And I said, go and ask your parents and like, they'll be sitting watching and I'll say, parents, 
Put your hand up if every day when the alarm goes off, you spring out of bed and you can't get to work fast just enough. Singing sunshine, just lollipops. Go, no, no, no. Yeah. So, see, they're doing it too. Yeah. You know, like it, it wasn't hard. It's just hard today. No, and that I guess with real estate, like COVID was a blessing because we made a lot of money. Um, it was also a curse because people's boundaries, like 10 years ago, I could switch off on a, we used to do our opens on a Sunday mm. with dad's business. I could switch off on a Friday night and not have people chase me all day mm. because it, you know, we were working the Sunday where now like people think it's okay to send the text message at 10 PM, call six times. Like I, I was on the phone yesterday dealing with an issue same number called me four times in the space of eight minutes left me four voicemails for information that is available online all in the description when did that change in the industry covid so yeah, it definitely was... like there, there was a switch about three four months into covid people just went and i don't know whether their iqs dropped or their probably something yeah. about vaccine <laughs> um sure as hell wasn't tracking but <laughs> Prior to that, you it would be the abnormal, like if someone was calling from WA, it was later at night because they're a couple of hours behind or they're overseas, like it was a rarity. Mm. And then I would say halfway through COVID, it just became common. Like I'm a night person, I will work till midnight, 1am, no issue. Mm. To get text messages and phone calls at 4.30 in the morning, just because of how I was brought up, I'd think, oh, well, that's a bit rude, a bit disrespectful. They must not have had good So parents. when you first started in the industry, to get a call at six o'clock on a Friday night just didn't happen? Just, yeah. You were talking maybe once a month, mm. if that. And somebody was dying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And it was really, really important. And and you took the good agents took the calls because that's how you made your money because everyone else wouldn't. Mm. Where now it's just the level of bombardment. Like we have people call, text, email, send a Facebook message, send an Instagram message in the space of a two minute window. And, and you're like, just not there in front of the yeah. phone. And you sit there and go, it's 9.45 p.m. And you're asking me what the open home time is. And it says open home Saturday, 10 to 10.30. The fact um, of the matter is too, like, there is a portion of them that are genuinely expecting you to reply at that time. Oh, yeah. So, and get rude if you don't. Every now and again, we get the, because oh, I answer my phone. Because you're a dickhead and you're <laughs> yeah, your phone. Yeah. Well, what happened to kids? Well, highly motivated. Um, <laughs> and we get people who go, oh, I didn't think you would answer. I was going to leave you a voicemail. And it's like, fucking call in the first yeah, It's like, oh, it's 10 o'clock at night. I assumed a number I didn't have in my phone's calling me. There must be something wrong. Um, but yeah, it, it's just a different, different level. And I think a lot of, especially the, not younger in age, just younger in experience, find it very hard to cope because they have been brought up in a world where, okay, well, work will be nine till five and you don't have to work past mm -hmm. five oh five and you should be compensated this and this should happen and that should happen versus no, sometimes your job's just shit. Mm. Sometimes you have to work. You're have like, to get those. Work we've had a really good run and I've got a really good second in command that works for me, but we still have those shitty days where two deals fall over where you put in 14 hours, make no money. Um, you've actually lost about $30,000 worth of income coming in. And then you've got to go home, recharge, which is drink some coffee, have a feed, sleep for six hours and come back and smile. Cause I was going to say, that was my next question. And clearly you can't stop at the bottle shop and pick up no, a fucking I can't six pack of beer. <laughs> yeah. How do you, because this is, again, I think a misinterpretation. People see those real estate shows. Yeah. They see the high flyers. But you said earlier, I want you get a hundred. It. It's an easy job you have here. Yeah. Put a bit yeah. of wax on, wax off. Oh, it's important. <laughs> um, people... You know, like you said earlier, a hundred no's before you get a yes. Yeah. How do you deal with those shit days where or shit weeks or shit, or shit months, months? Yeah. <laughs> where it's just like surely you have at least one or two moments where you go, This is fucked. I do. I I've got different coping mechanisms to most people. Um so what makes yours different? Uh not normally pain. So my, my coping mechanism, when I've had a real bad day, I go to the gym and I don't go to the gym because I want to be fit and healthy. Um, that's a byproduct. I go to the gym because I need to work out anger and frustration that I can't let out in, in a workplace or in the public. And it works really, really well. Good. Um, but you've got to, you've got to learn to love the rejection and the hate. <clears throat> like we, we literally get abused 
collapsed. Like we have properties where 10 people want to buy it. Only one person can. Had one two weeks ago, 25 offers. One person got a congratulations call. Mm. The other 24 got the sorry you missed out, to which uh, you cop the, oh, that's fucked. Oh, you told us, you know, put our best and final offer for it. It's like, well, I did tell you that. You did and you didn't win. Um, that's the way the cookie this crumbles. Sound, this um, sounds like yeah. a new problem. <laughs> yeah. But people, especially at the moment, they, I guess they've been, they're so tired from the process because it's a horrible process by selling but they need someone to vent and they think it's okay to take it out of mm. the agent, not mm. realizing we are humans. Like I, I just think I'm very lucky and blessed. I know I've got a great family. I've got a great support network. Um, and there's nothing you can do or say to me that's going to hurt me. Yeah. Um, but most people don't have that ability to put that wall up. Most people will take it personally and go. It's probably, well, I mean, you're probably very good. It's very hard probably not to take that. You know, like that mm. fear of other fear of people's opinions. I, I work with colleagues that are a couple of years in the game, and and their 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 biggest fear is the client's not going to like me, or this person's not going to like me, and think poorly of me. Which for the first, and I, I try and tell them, yeah, the first hundred times it sucks. It's like getting a little cut. You get a little cut, mm. it hurts. You if you cut the same spot, you get mm. a scar. You cut that scar again, you get more scar. Mm. You get to a point where you sit there and go, oh, try to cut me. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like. He's got a knife that ain't going to work, but you build up that tolerance, but it is a, a, a mental headspace, which a lot of people aren't prepared for that. There, there's nights I go home, kiss my kids on the head, say goodnight to my wife and go sit outside with the dog just because I need to, yeah, I need to get back into the good headspace. And everyone sits there and goes, why would you sit outside at 1am in the dark? And I'm like, because I, I know I've got to show up tomorrow. Because that's what I do. And I'm not taking it out of my wife, I'm not taking it out of my kids. So mm -hmm. like I, I do sometimes crack at home and and I hate it. But I know when I'm going to crack, I normally jump in the car and then I will drive away from the house until I can get my headspace sorted. And I think allowing ourselves the... um giving ourselves the right to be able to do that. Like we, we can do that every now and then. Yeah. Like if, if you That's didn't. That's not failing. If I didn't, no. I, I would pop you, and it would end up on well, the news. Well, if you didn't do it at all, yeah, we'd be reading about you yeah. in the news. Which we don't. We don't want. We, we want great real estate agent. Well, I think we do. On the news I mean, versus, do. you know. Versus agent snapped. Um, but you would again see people who would be, you know, and like we're not built for everything. Have you ever had a conversation with an employee or an ex-employee or a colleague and go, maybe this just isn't for you? Ah, uh, a heap of times. Normally the ones that think they're going to be awesome are the most precious, gentle souls, mm -hmm. um, which unfortunately <laughs> is not the right job. Like you, you've, just, you've got to, well, you've, like you said, you've got to be ruthless. You've got to say no. You've got to say no and, and you've got to be prepared to put up with the crap. Mm. It would be like a a petite five foot one mm. dog loving person becoming a police officer that doesn't believe in violence and and thinks everyone deserves a second chance. It's yeah, like that you're not, right you, not going to survive. And then what's funny is ones that you sit there and think, "Good lord!" Like when you look at where they've come from or 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 what their their skill set is, you go, "They might struggle," and they just hit the ground running. Like it's yeah. a, just that belief of, oh, "I told me to get fucked." <laughs> so like a I've lot another of one. Well, like a lot of jobs, there isn't necessarily a type. No, no. I think it's got more to do with your personality, but also your mental mental solitude, your ability to process mm. and do it quickly and under pressure. And... Yeah. And I mean, this is something that, and one reason I did want to have you on was I think there is that stigma, like you're one of the good guys when it comes to this industry. Try to be, and everyone still hates you for it. But there is also, like I said, yeah. this stigma attached where you say real estate agent, it's like, oh, yeah. right. Yeah, it's like, oh, yeah. yeah. I get it. yeah. And the worst bit is I understand the stigma. <laughs> I get it, man. I get it. <laughs> Worked around it long enough where I sit there and go, like, we, we have it. That's we fair. see it every day. We just sit there and go, you're the reason we've got a bad name. Um, and social media is beautiful now because <laughs> you just sit there and go, really? Yeah. Really? That That's why. Um, that's why people don't like us. But. Well, see, now they're, they're ruled by it. So like like I said, you ring those 24 people that didn't get the sale and they're the ones who give you the fucking one-star review. Yeah. And you go, 
it's not my fucking fault. You didn't put yeah, in enough. You didn't win. Yeah. <laughs> it's where I think a lot of people think we actually have a lot of control over what an owner decides. Mm. And the reality is our job is to collect pool them information and give give the owner the choice. Mm. The only time I make the decisions when we're selling one of our properties. And the reality is I don't make the decision. Jody does. <laughs> <laughs> I may be the real estate agent. Jody makes those decisions. Um hundred percent. Because I can't be trusted with hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, I would have sold our place a year ago, but she's all like, oh, it's a home. We love it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But that's, um, that's probably the other thing I thought of before, before we move on. You would be used to it by now, but you're handling hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions, millions of dollars some days. A day. Yeah. yeah. Do you ever go, fuck, I'm handling all these other people's money. I better not fuck this up. <laughs> <laughs> most days uh, oh. no pressure yeah no, no pressure that's probably the the best and worst bit of the job is i can walk into an appointment and if you get along well with the client 45 minutes later you're leaving with the sign forms and a key to their house mm. and it's like what the hell you called me two days ago i've showed up and within half an hour we've built up enough rapport and trust that you say, here's a key to my house, mm. take a couple of thousand dollars, now go sell my biggest asset. Yeah. And often they only have some very basic questions. And, and most, because most real estate agents spend them, the time talking about how awesome they are. Um, you, you do the unthinkable. Uh, I listen to the uh, I, I sit there and go, what, what do you guys want or need? Um, if you're here, where do you want to be? Because that that's the job, facilitate the move. But the fact that they will give us trust like that, mm. In such a short time frame, like, that's more pressure than the money. Yeah, I, I sit there and go, "Holy hell!" Like we we have our our open routine, how we go in and we turn the lights on mm. and open the windows, and we go work from the left all the way around to the right, and then when you lock up, you go go from the right all the way around to the left, so you don't leave it. Like I'm more particular with my a client's four hundred thousand dollar unit mm. than I am with our house. Yeah. <laughs> And I'll leave the door unlocked all the fucking and time. I, I'm, I'm pretty particular because a bit of OCD where it's like last night for the fifth time. I'm just going to check that front door. Like I'm, I'm driven back to properties when I've been 15 minutes away going, shit, did I do the laundry door? I remember the screen door. I'm thinking, you know, did I do the glass door? Because I had the one up the top, which I would have done and I've always done, but I've driven back to go, oh, I did do the laundry but door. But those little things like that, is what has kept you functioning highly in the industry yeah. for the last 20 years. Because it's a referral. Like once you Refer get... Like anything, same for us here, referrals are our referrals biggest, are, our biggest yeah. thing. For, for the first first 10 years, I never understood it. And dad was always do what's right by the client, ask for a nice review, like we mm. work hard. That, mm. that That's the best way they can say thank you. And I, I have clients now where we've never actually sold for them. We've just given them advice on their house or for a family member. And then they've gone to work and we've got their friend and then that person's gone to work. Like one of my best referrers lives on the North side and I've sold a couple of properties for her now. Um, but beautiful Moira, I would have had 15, 20 referrals out of this one contact. It's every, unreal, isn't it? And like every time someone calls me and says, oh, my friend Moira told me about you. I'm like, what the hell? Another one. <laughs> So which my team get a message, can you please drop off some nice champagne from water at the drain? <laughs> Maura's got like a wine cellar. Because we, we, we like to say thank you. Yeah. But like it all started from a conversation 12, 15 years it's ago. crazy, isn't it? Where at the time the kill wasn't there to go for the sale because she didn't need to make the sale. It was more advice. And it resulted in a sale two years later. But if I had gone that time, I would have burned that business. It's fucking, I, I had just this morning... A real estate agent for you? No. Or well, you actually, you did. Ring, uh, ring. Why are we doing this Were in your you house? <laughs> yeah. I'm um, in your house. I've got the paws. There's two dogs. Um, I want to sell. Yeah. Um, I was taking a PT client for a walk. Um, sounds like they're a dog. I was going to say, so, sounds like my type of PT. We're not on a lead. Um, I can walk. They needed to walk. Um, we walked past a woman. Um, I trained Tanya's son. 15 plus years ago, she stopped, said, g'day, said, did you get that woman come from such and such? I met her at the pool and she had her son. I refer all the kids here. And I walked off and Ben went, who the fuck was that? <laughs> and I said, I trained her kid 15, 15 odd ago. years ago yeah. and she still is giving us referrals. Which and is... you just, you say thank you. And yeah. it's just that, that's what gets you business. Which is sad because that's just service. 
Like, well, I think that's, that's dare I go being a nice, dying. dare I go yeah. being a nice person again? Yeah. You, you you are doing service the way service should be, but apparently no one else does it. So then you've stood out in her in her life, and, and fifteen years is a long time. Like, yeah, you've and got I mean, a noticeable face, but yeah, thanks, thanks, like, fifteen years. The funny thing is, like Jesse, Jesse's like a grown, like he's a grown man now. He's married. He's a school teacher. <laughs> yeah, I think he actually might have a son. Um, so but, Jesse, time to bring yeah. the kids in for a bit of Jesse, training. Where the fuck? Yeah. Are you? <laughs> All right. Question eight. One time you have backed yourself when everything was saying to just give in. <laughs> this goes back to COVID. Um, and what a lot of people, even friends and family don't know, is halfway through COVID, my beautiful wife didn't cope very well, had anxiety that led to depression and just pretty much a little breakdown. Um, and again, when you come from a... I can fix everything. Um, also a suck it up sort of attitude. Yeah. Like I can do what I do because I've got a, an amazing wife who looks after our home mm -hmm. and probably a month into her not being out of cope, I had to, didn't have any choice, take on the home duties as well as the work duties, which for those husbands, home duties suck. Um, like feed the kids, wash the clothes, wash the kids. And that that was, I think, until our about our third appointment with the therapist, because where I was struggling and everything in my body was just saying, just fix it, just fix it. Um, some things you can't fix. Mm. And that that was uh, probably the closest I've ever got to breaking because I was doing 16, 17 hours a day. Like work still had to happen because that was the only way to make money. The industry had changed. We weren't allowed to bloody go outside. And my wife couldn't get out of bed for three, four, five days at a time. And our kids back then were seven and eight. Like they, they had no idea what was going on. Like the first two days, they're like, oh, mummy doesn't feel well. And like it, it, it changed our whole dynamics. But it was that was probably the most humbling experience that I've ever had, just because I didn't have an option. It wasn't like I, I wanted to pack it in and go, no, this is too hard. And mm. I know people that didn't survive COVID because of mental health challenges mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and relationships didn't survive because why Why go through the pain when you can walk away? But um, I think because of our, our girls and also our, our bond, the, the the option was not, there wasn't an option. It was uh, mm -hmm. time to step up. And I do apologise to my kids. They ate so many two-minute noodles. <laughs> And so many nachos um, and, and chicken nuggets and chips. Right. Um, you know what? They got fed. That they got fed, yeah. And I think that's the thing. Um, what, so you, like your family upbringing too, like it was interesting how you just said then, um, you know, you being the man now doing all this stuff. Yeah. You would have not seen that happening as a kid. No. So you're going, this is, this is odd. It not just seem not happening, but I'm, and it's not stereotyping things, but I'm a big believer we're good at some things and we're not good at others. Exactly. Um, and where Jodie yeah. and I have always worked really well is everything I am horrible at. Like she is in touch with her emotions. She's mentally balanced. She's mm. just a beautiful soul. Mm. And I'm a damaged and truck. I'm and I'm <laughs> It's God. Um, <laughs> so we, we compliment the yin and the yang. Um, no, if anyone ever hurts the kids, I reckon she's got a bit of dragon in her. <laughs> Just a bit. But it, it, it was like the probably the, the hard thing was the first couple of days because of the not knowing. And mm. I I learn everything from experience. I sit there, if you give me a book to read and, and I struggle, like I, I sit there and see how much you read mm. and I'm trying to get myself into it. But I struggle that way where I learn better from experience. Mm. It's like, you tell me that's hot, I touch it, I burn myself. I'll only touch it I'm five or six time. times yeah. before I go, shit, that's really hot, I should <laughs> stop doing that. But in that that first couple of weeks, I guess it was more that fight, fight or flight mode. And you where... would have felt powerless too. Absolutely powerless, which I'm not used to. Like, mm. I'm not a big I can't unit. fix this. But I'm also not scared of many things. Mm. Again, from the, the upbringing, it's like, oh, well, there's two of them. Well, <laughs> It'll be fun. Um, I'm either going to die or not die. Like, they're your options. But not being able to fix something like that, but also having no understanding, which it, it took months and also getting professional help because, like, finding out 
the reading thing when my daughter was diagnosed with dyslexia going oh, that, that's normal um, mm, mm. trying to understand because I've never and I don't know whether it's just I'm not wired that way um, because we are all wired differently but what she was going through like there was nothing more devastating than seeing the person you love broken mm. where if someone had heard her I can go fix that mm. if someone had said something they shouldn't mm. have said I can go fix that mm. um, but I couldn't fix what was going on in her head and in her heart and that 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 was the thing that was killing me it's like and that would have probably would have been hard for you to a not get frustrated but be visibly frustrated yeah, very hard that, because that's when the you would have been hung up yeah because I, I needed to be out of there and do anything yeah. and and again to not not take it out but not to like vent and go like why 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 can't you you know yeah. like kids like just fucking yeah you know, can't you just understand go to bed for the seven days <laughs> um if your father hasn't slept more than five hours in three weeks um, a day and i'm running on empty like that that was uh, the heart that that would have been by far the hardest challenge and i've done some dumb shit mm, prior yeah. to joey jody yeah, we um we but that that was that was to me something where it literally sitting up at night once she could finally get to sleep and like she would get to sleep for three hours with, with help of medication and then be up for five hours mm. and because i'm a night person i could then could not go to sleep mm. until i knew she was asleep part mm. of the whole protection thing and it was just running on empty, but to to not be able to just fix it, mm. but not be able to understand, like it wasn't a, like it was such a, like our third session with this um I think they call them a psychiatrist, psychologist, whatever those smart people are, and she was trying to explain to me that you know what's going on in her head and how she she's looking at things whilst it makes no sense to me. Yeah, it, it, this is her world at the moment, and I'm sitting there going, yeah, but the mm. doctor lady. You just stop, like yeah. <laughs> Again, the hot plate hot. Don't fucking touch it. But we had a whole session where she was pretty much giving me advice on my job isn't to fix it. My yeah. job is to literally be there for support and understand I can't fix it. And that's really hard for you because yeah. you go, you don't understand. Yeah, I, I don't do I, that. I don't do the not fixing. It's like, well, don't tell me your problem if you don't want it fixed. Mm -hmm. And like. Now she tells me problems with her work that she doesn't want me to fix. And she starts a conversation is I need to tell you something and I don't want you to fix it. So I know different mode, time to listen. <laughs> so coming out of that, um, like I said earlier, it's a management process now. Yeah. Um, and it's a different skill set. Which... Has that changed the dynamic of the family? It, the, the year so you were talking about the school run yeah you're so talking about the job school run so the job yep so prior to that happening majority of her life was the stay home parent mm. um she just started doing some training because she wanted to become a school teacher and like that's when it all went down from there but coming out of that the her being able to have her her life while still being part of the family unit that that became a a balancing act which we struggled with for the first year um mainly because of it was just yeah it was a new system we had to learn and and not just new like you've never done that no i I, I honestly thought when she said i need to go back to work and i need to do this um for her growth but also her mental health i said they're going what the hell you want to go do a job for 20 dollars an hour like the backers days and take me out of my job which my hourly rate depends but it's enough that we can mm. be a one family income and i'm like in my world that makes no sense you don't send a thousand dollar an hour person to do a 20 dollar an hour job and mm. initially i'm like why are you sending a thousand dollar an hour person to do a ten dollar an hour job but <laughs> now you're realizing I guess the whole, and this, this always sounds so cliche. And I was only talking about this yesterday to someone money can buy you only so much. Yeah. And you can have all this money and, and not, not be happy and be yeah. fucking miserable. Yeah. Which is still hard to learn because it doesn't, to most people that makes no sense. Well, this is, you know, this conversation I had with someone was, we were talking about somebody who's ridiculously rich yeah oh the silly rich yeah, yeah like silly rich like stupid rich 
and They're I always said, the nicest people. It's like, <laughs> but you want a Maserati? You'll get your Maserati. Got two in the shed. Um, it's the thing, like someone being given a bill for something for like six hundred thousand dollars and just going, "Yep, you better pay that one." Yeah, and that. it's like, can you imagine never like waking up every day for the rest of your life and never wondering how am I going to pay that bill? Yeah, where will I live? How will I eat? But then there might be all this other shit in their life that's just it's fucking yeah. falling yeah. apart. Yeah, debt. Well, I think we've all got challenges. It's just different. Yeah. yeah. And I mean it's a different sort of debt too. Like, you know, for you, you've you've grown up in a well, your your job for 20 years has been dollar the, sign. Yeah. Pay, pay the bills, put roof over the head, feed, clothes. Yeah. And now you're probably realizing what in the last four. Yeah, three to four years. There's a lot more to it than that. Yeah, we bought a caravan. I take holidays. The kids, like, we go away. Like, last year was the first time since we'd been together we took a month off work. Like, our honeymoon was two weeks. We got married, went away to Fiji. I made three sales while she was asleep reading books and that kind of stuff because you could only get reception at the, like, in the hotel. In the hotel, <laughs> bit, but not in the little villa thing. Um, and outside of that, that, the biggest holiday we took was we took the caravan up to Townsville, see my brother, go do some sightseeing, like two young girls in a car for 16 hours over two days was going to either make us or break us. And now every school holidays, we have something booked in where three, four years ago, I never would have done that. It would have been, I can't go on a holiday. You can go on a holiday. I can't go on the holiday. I'm going to make money. Where now it's like, bugger it. Mm. I'll make the money leading up to it. We'll go have the holiday and then I'll make the money after it. It's that classic case of do you live to work or do you work to live? Live, yeah. And do you um so here's the here's probably ducking back to the if you weren't doing this now question. If that hadn't happened to Jody and opened up both your eyes mm. to where things are needing to go. No, we would have been in a worse what, spot. What would have happened? Don't know, probably wouldn't have survived it. Just because of the trajectory we were we were on. Mm. But no, I, I think as much as it changed her, it changed me. And big believer of if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. Mm. Or you either win or you learn. You don't nothing nothing will ever keep you down type thing. And it, it changed us both, but made us stronger people. Yeah. The year and a half and the hell we went through during that time. Hardly see light at the end of the yeah, table, but it was it was, it yeah, was fun. Yeah, it wasn't like, oh yeah, you, you don't want to hop out of bed again for day yeah, three. Awesome, I'm, I'm like, and I'm still going to feed those two. Like they they are mine, right? Yep, yeah, got to keep them alive. Yep. But yeah, but now now wouldn't change like that. There's still issues that have because of that, and things that will never never be the same. But like all of this stuff, it's all you will always have it there. It's just how you manage it. Yeah, how you manage it. And also being able to read the signs. Like now I can, whenever we have certain events on because there's certain triggering things that still happen, mm. I can literally see it in her eyes now. And they're, they're like, not that it's good at reading the play, but you sit and go, there, there's subtle little things that happen, the, the, mm. the twitch with the hand start to shake and then she, her eyes start darting around. And I know, great, I've got 10 or 15 minutes to get us out of here. I've got a window. <laughs> or it's going to be a shit two weeks. Yeah. Or if I get us out of here within 15 minutes, it's going to be a shit night. And it doesn't matter what we're doing. It's mm. just like, it could be a birthday party. It could be an awards night. It, to me, where prior to that happening, mm. I probably wouldn't have put the priority on, I've got to deal with this straight away. Where now, it's uh, if I see it out of the corner of my eye, it doesn't matter what we're doing. It's like, and I won't say, oh, we need to go white wife's not feeling great it's uh i've had something come up we need to go because yeah. i don't want that pressure of her going explaining us well oh no we, we can't go now i'm like fuck it. Mm. it it's not important if it's not if it's not jody and the girls it ain't important anymore um and that's again that shifting of priorities isn't it mm. it's changed so much for you which makes you grow up which Got it, man. yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's something we don't remember just going to the beach, knocking back a few drinks and being like, hello, Saturday. Uh, were, you, were you a caravaner before? No, I used to think it people the... were. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were dead set to see people with caravans go, they have to be 85 
or unemployed. And now um, you're on your second caravan. Yep, second caravan. <laughs> I bought bought the car to make sure it towed the van when we got the new van. Mate, I was the same. I was never a caravan person. And the same thing, we're on our second caravan. There are processes of it, i.e. Learning. Fucking yeah. reversing the thing yeah. that still scare the shit out of me. But it's all right, scratches and dents. You can yeah, well, out. you know, the process, the process of it and that two weeks that we have away, it's fucking awesome. Mm. It's so good. Question nine. Three pieces of advice to people that are finding reasons to not back themselves to instead back themselves. And three nice reasons that are good for on air. Yeah. Not just harden the fuck up. There's no fucking, you know. Yeah. All right, that's one. Number two. No, No, this is all more from personal experience. Uh, The first would be to stop second guessing. Most people overanalyze, overthink, and will spend fucking hours or days talking themselves out of something rather than just committing. Um, And I I was guilty of it high school when i was younger same shit Mm. didn't want to do that wonder what that would do Mm. and you'd run through every possible scenario where most of the time it ain't that bad Mm. like yeah your headspace is your biggest enemy and it's just like just do it and see what happens yeah like big believer of you're either going to win or you'll learn (laughs) Mm. or you'll die like don't do dumb stuff um don't see if you're allergic to bullets we just assume you are but do you think now you're much better at just I'm just going to fucking do this, and if yeah. it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Yeah, mainly because the experience has told me that out of the 99 times it didn't work, oh, well, well, I didn't really take too many steps back. Yeah. But the one time it pays off, the rewards are there, and we normally think it's going to be a lot worse than what it is. Yeah. Like your own mind will beat you up a lot more than what reality will. Yeah. Because most people are pretty weak. Well, not just like emotionally and mentally. Your mind's often your greatest adversary. Mm. What's number two? Well, then it comes down to don't be scared of failure. And that, again, going back to either the martial arts when I was younger or dad's training and the way I was brought up, it, it, it's that whole, because I've always surrounded myself with the motivation and that kind of thing, mm. the, the whole rule of, you know, if you try and fail, it's better than, you know, it's 10 times better than not not trying at all, but things just take time. It's a process. Everybody mm. wants an instant win or instant gratification. Mm. Like, go back to when I was in sport, like I only ever wanted to play sport, I'd win it. And then my parents got me into martial arts, which apparently is really hard to win. Yeah. And takes like yeah. years and years and years. And when, Cause when you're three years in going, I'm a yellow belt. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you don't know shit. Yeah. <laughs> then someone's a blue belt <laughs> and kicks you in the face and you're like, I didn't know we were allowed to kick in bases. Um, so often. I had it just the other week. I had someone in here, was a jiu-jitsu class, hour and a half jiu-jitsu class, their first ever martial arts class. We do an hour and then they have a couple of light that, rounds. That's a lot of pain in an oh, hour. Yeah. But they turn around and they go, I don't know what I'm doing. Right. And I say it all the time. I say, You've been doing jiu-jitsu for 60 minutes. You don't know fucking <laughs> shit. You've been doing you it for years and you still don't know what you're doing. Many things. Yeah. Um, it's, I think that failure thing, like you said, the real estate side of things, you know, people have the rose-coloured glasses when they mm. walk in and they've watched too much a TV, fo- yeah. too much Foxtel. Yes. Um, Selling Sunset. Sorry, I'm not a blonde bombshell. Um, far from it. <laughs> yeah. Far from it. If you're not watching this, he is far yeah. from it. Um, you've, like I said, even 20 years experience, you would still fuck up the odd sale. Every week. Yeah. Like, and, and, but, and you hang up the phone and go, you fucking oh, idiot. So, sometimes <laughs> my team put their head over and go, what the fuck? Uh, yeah. I just like, yeah, not, not my that age. Me. <laughs> but it, and it comes back to like the rule of averages, but not being afraid to fail because when i was younger i was where now i sit there and go i would have four five hundred opportunities a year now to win business yeah and i win 70 times 60 to 70 times a year yeah that means there's 370 times where where i don't win okay and it normally takes about 100 phone calls or 100 conversations to get an opportunity so it's a vicious numbers game but not not being scared to fail like i'm 
the way my father brought me up was we're, we're systems as we don't lose, you know, mm -hmm. we just don't give up type thing. But it's you just learn. It's like, well, if you did did this and this and this was the outcome, the worst thing you can do is A and B again. Mm. So do A and C next time. Mm. And I think that's where my, most people with their self analyzing to think, oh, oh, well, this could happen and this could happen. Mm. And they're trying to play a hundred different scenarios where it's like, just do it, learn. You're either going to get it or you're going to learn from it and know what, what to do next time. It's that whole facing fear, isn't it? When, mm. when we go straight away, like, um, what if this doesn't work? Yeah. What if it and does? That, what if it does? And <laughs> most people sit there and go, oh, what if this, yeah, what if this doesn't work? It's a, that's just where they naturally that's their default. progress to. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, what if it fucking does work? Yeah. yeah. You know? No one ever thinks of, yeah. It's like those people that complain about not winning the lotto and never buying the ticket. I know. Like, well, you know, there's only one person that can I try, win it. I try and fail every week. Yeah. <laughs> Mine's really need to get back yeah. onto that. I was going to say birthday day. Sorry. <laughs> I'll never lotto. Yeah. Speak to phone call about 8.30. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why would it yeah. not happen to that? What's number three? Number three is to stop trying to be someone you're not and just be yourself. I think a lot of the self-doubt comes to the the fear of what other people will think. Is authenticity something in your industry that is... Doesn't exist. Yeah. It, I was trying to be yeah. diplomatic. <laughs> no. The, re the reality is that in, in 1%. It exists. And are they the, the good other, guys? Yeah. The good guys are the high performers that have survived that understand that for someone to entrust you with a certain asset or a certain amount of money, there's got to be got to be some trust. And there's no point being something you're not. Like for the first 10 years of my career, I was trying to be something I wasn't. Mm. We were working in a different market space. That, that it was a different trajectory with the business, but I was never going to be a real estate agent. I was going to run the business where... When I could let my personality out a little bit, I learned real quickly that people either love me or they hate me. There's yeah. no, there's no middle ground. Like it is, I get too extremes, and yeah. most of the time, who you think's going to love you, hate you, and who you think are, well, they're never going to do business with me. Mm. They think you are God's gift to real estate and want to mm. hold your hand and have you walk them through the process, yeah. and couldn't do it without just being who I am. Like, I can't hide it anymore. I used to. I used to hide it really well. <laughs> why do you think, why do you think you hit it? Because I, I, I honestly thought this is what people wanted from me. This is what people expected. Because the, 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 re the real back Brad Sissons wasn't going to be able to get what was needed. Yeah. Or, or I was too young or I wouldn't have the skill set type thing. Like, especially in the first couple of years. What was the negative? Because when, how old were you when you started? Not real estate. Saying. So 19, you're trying to sell. Uh, I was pretending to be 25. I was going to say, you're trying to sell yep. a house to a God, 30, 40 plus year old person. Or listing a house for a 60 year old. Uh, yeah, And they're just calling you, what the fuck do you know? Pretty kid? much, yep. Which a good line used to be, well, my father's a real estate agent. I've been doing this longer than your, your kids have been alive because... Back in the 90s, it was okay to take your kids out on site and fold broke <laughs> and get a box drop. And, and you don't get your kids to do that? I think they helped me once thinking it was a fun game. You just go, um, never again. Yeah. <laughs> they thought it was a game. And I'm like, I can't do this for them. <laughs> but no, that, that, that was a, a – it, it actually made my business go so much better because I just started doing business with people that wanted – wanted what I had yeah. to offer and realized I wasn't one of the out of the box. I don't need to be like that. Yeah. And you get people to trust you more. Like well, they trust you. I have they clients. don't trust who they believe you are. Yeah, not not the the photo, not the image. Correct. All right, mate. Number ten, a quote to live by. Quote to live by. Um for anyone born after nineteen ninety, you won't know of Zig Ziglar. Oh. But he was a big sales training coach from America mm -hmm. um, and inadvertently had a lot to do with my upbringing in my real estate career. Okay. Um, compliments to cassette tapes. <laughs> wow. So there was actually 10 or 12 tapes in total. Like you put them in the player in your car and you listen to them on your way to and from work. Yeah, one of the, now I think they do podcasts or downloads on YouTube. Yep. You should go on one. Yeah. All right. One day. <laughs> <laughs> probably the big one that's always always stood out because i've got hundreds on my phone but is one of ziggy's that said you can have everything you want in life if you just help enough people get what they want give me the last example 
of that happening for you? How recent do you want to tell me? Yesterday? A year ago? Some, one that, something where you being nice to someone, you've walked away and gone, oh, yeah, fucking cool. Well, one of my colleagues I work with who came from another brand and had very, very poor initial training um, comes to me, came to me a lot with just questions, just needed some advice, just need, needed help because they, they hadn't been older than me, but hadn't been trained mm -hmm. well. And we, we ended up having a chat. I went out to an appointment just to help her. Surely an appointment, she's just like, come out. It was family friend of hers um, and thought nothing else of it. Just went out, gave them the advice. They weren't in a position to do anything. Um, six months later, we both get the call up. We sign up, not one, but two properties, both yeah. multi-million dollar properties. And one of them we sold before Christmas. It was just no expectations. She wanted some help. It was in my old hood, so happy to go out to Spring Hill. And yeah, literally six months later, it's like, oh, we've got a different property. We need help. Yeah. And it was, we both got rewarded very well for it. It wasn't an easy job, but it was uh, what what started as I will go out for half an hour, have a chat with the owner. I think I spent two hours there at yeah, the right. first meeting because they, they had no idea where they were in the process, what they needed to do. There'd been a death in the family. The will hadn't been done properly. Like... It was a long, long process, which we just walked them through going, this is where you are. Here's the next 19 steps for you. Mm. And yeah, just out of, she asked for help. I was, had a free afternoon, happy to do it. And now we're both really happy off the back of it. You would have, I was trying again to think of the words. Real estate industry is probably not necessarily known. I'm trying <laughs> not to sound horrible. You, you want to, um, it's rather cutthroat. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, look after me and yep. fuck everyone else yeah it is very uh, it and it still is very dog eat dog like there's a lot of but obviously you being nice to people clearly that pays off doesn't it it does because like, like and i mean i yeah, it, pay off not financially but, but it, mor yeah. morally like just it feels it, good it, it's more of a and i think it all comes back to that protecting and providing thing like when, when i like I know what people go through. Like mm. I hit a wall every five years and it's just burnout where your body shuts down, mm. and just your mental health's not in a good space. And when I sit there and go, if I can help someone not go through it or not go through it as bad, mm. like if I can take you from a, I'm going to jump off a cliff and bring you back to, I'm just going to walk in front of a bus. Yeah. Yep. I sit there and go, oh, I brought you one step back type thing. And, and that from, from just, I guess, my DNA, if I if I can help someone not go through something that I had to go through, any day of the week, that, no issue from it. I have, I have people that don't work in the business I work in who are direct competition to me and my business who still call me for advice. Now, now most people just think, oh, hang up, fuck it. Where I sit there and go, oh, you got a question. Oh, I had that a few years ago. This is what I would do. Why do you answer the phone? I mean, like we get the protect yeah. and everything, but is that because, you know. That's because you... my father always answered his phone. Well, that, that's sure. all it is. That he answered his phone. He he helped people. And, and back back when I would witness some of the stuff, I'd sit there and go, why, why would you like it? And I couldn't understand it. But right. why would you do that with that person and now you when, all, when all we want to do is destroy them and their business? We're not making money out yeah. of that. Yeah. And that's, that's, a, that's a hard thing because, and I mean, I struggle with it too. Like you spend so much time on people sometimes for nothing financially yeah. back um, or no reward you see, but then walking down the street with a client yeah, fifteen years. Up. Fifteen years later, yeah. ten years still, still referring, your still business. referring yeah. people to us. Yeah. And you go, okay, that pays off in the end. It, it does, and I think because everyone's so used to instant gratification, and like, don't get me wrong, I am. Real estate's a drug, like mm. an absolute drug, where you want you hit every day. But being able to sit there and go, well, I'm doing something for someone else. It does, yeah. It's not going to benefit me, but if it helps them, I, don't, yeah. I think that's just being a good human. And we've all gone way to the other way. Do you find there's um, less and less of them these days? Yeah. Like, it's scary. Like, I, I sit there and go, I used to have a, a big network, where now I have a very tight 
group of people I would call friends, like that very tight number, like count them on, on a hand. Mm. And that's just because I said, oh, I only want to associate with people like myself and like-minded and they're getting fewer and fewer to find. Well, even now, like I said, your time is limited. Your time space has changed. Mm. I waste it on yeah. people who aren't, what, not, what, not, why not worry about what they want and what they that. Yeah. You know, those people, like you said, as we often joke, the people you call at two in the morning and say, I've done something. Do, where do I need to yeah, be? And do I yeah. need to bring my own shovel? Your, your car or my car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think that that's where that that's more important. I would rather have one or two of them than sit there and go, Oh, did you see I've got 30,000 of these likes and I've got this and that mm. because these, this day and age, it's all show and it's all fake. Like, and that, so when I call you at 2am, please bring your own shovel. Yeah, yeah, I've got yeah. I've got one shovel, but I never carry a second. <laughs> I know you like call me unless I genuinely need to bring yeah, a yeah. shovel. Um maybe a bat too. <laughs> he's not kidding. Uh, <laughs> and now I lost my train of thought. Um oh the thing too is like that must be a really good feeling too, because you would have, like you were talking about some older people, like a house that's been in the family for literally generations. Yeah. And they're giving you this immense amount of trust. You like it's it must be a great feeling, but it's also a bit of pressure. Because you go, I don't want to fuck this yeah, up. Yeah, don't want to mess it up. Yeah. yeah. And, and it it is like contrary to popular belief there is actually a skill set and plans and systems required for real estate like it's not just second not just take a photo and there it is on instagram like any job. you can be really good at it or really shit yeah. at it and, and get when, when people trust you with that kind of asset like it's funny it's not just a big one sometimes it's the little ones like more of them the more life-changing deals I've done are for a mum, dad financial trouble have a little investment worth 250 300k that owes them 350 and in the market it's worth 280 and we can get them 320 and, and make their debt or their loss mm. smaller where the, that's probably more rewarding mm. because someone's coming to you with, with a need and they're like it's it's not i'm selling it because i mm. i want to make money it's up i'm selling it because if i don't i'm going to lose things or my family's going to be negatively impacted when someone comes to you with that and just know when you've got the experience, you can sit there, okay, here's your problem. We do this, this, and this. I can minimize your problem, but you got to commit to this and trust me that this is going to work. It's a it's a very nice feeling when they go, okay, well, we trust you. Yeah, and that's fucking huge. Yeah. Because people trusting people there, is something probably that's more, dying. There's probably more pressure with that than the two or $3 million listing. Fucking oh. Yeah. That's someone's life. Mm. You know, and again, no not to take the shine off people who worked hard and have those million dollars properties, but you know, this is, if this fucks up, that's then done yeah. financially done. Hmm. So there is pressure, but I guess it's like that whole scar tissue thing that it, when you've done it and you know, it works, it's hmm. following that system. And the hardest bit is probably just being able to back yourself to know, okay, if I do this, it'll work. You should put that on a t-shirt. Yeah. Is there any up here? Oh, there. Oh, just to say, yeah. <laughs> um, say I didn't even get my bat back yourself. Oh, you? I'm like, yeah. Happy to wear it around. Have on the racks, mate. <laughs> All right. Um, Brad Sissons, thank you very much. Absolute pleasure, Mr. Someone, Rabel. again, who was a little bit nervous. <laughs> camera shy you've done all right man so, you've done really good yeah a little camera shy yeah but you know you've done good you've oh, done thank good. you um guys please give a like and a share and a follow and a listen and a rave about all our podcasts and what we do um these podcasts are a bit of a labor of love for me and um i really enjoy interviewing people um that are my friends and um just letting people see how there's all these people doing really cool shit that you just walk past on the street and think nothing of. But uh, as we know, like my friend here, he's got a bit of shit going on and he's been through a bit of shit and he's come out the other side. So, Mr. Sissons. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. We're out. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you for listening. And uh, we will see you on another podcast soon. Good. Bye.